Query and Company. I'm going to be keeping your company for the next few hours. You are not going to believe the company. This company. You're going to bankrupt your mama's company. At least I have the radio to keep me company. On 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Jimmy, you attended... Indiana University in Bloomington, correct? That is a factual statement, Jake. Eddie, you were a product and a graduate of the, or are, of the University of Indianapolis, correct? Yes, sir. I would like for you guys to, if you could, let's get 1.21 gigawatts and let's get in the DeLorean and let's go back to the spring of your, any year, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, in my case, fifth year, sixth year, and then year 34. And any of those when you had finals, okay? So you got three finals left, and it was always fun when you were the one who all your fi- – are you wearing – what is your shirt? Is that a Donald Duck shirt? It is a Donald Duck yelling at the – you know, he's yelling at a golf flag because he missed a putt and he's not happy. It's Masters week, Jake. Come on. Okay. What's wrong with my you – don't, you don't like my, my festive polo? I thought you would appreciate that. I don't that. have my glasses on, so I can't – from here, you, it just looks like um, – You have a good Donald Duck voice. I figured this would be right up your alley. I do like Donald Duck, I, although I think Daffy is superior to Donald, truth be told. I think Daffy I – would, I wouldn't fight you on that. Yeah, Daffy's cooler than yeah, Donald. I would agree. Like, Daffy's – Daffy's got game. Let's like, if you were going to go golfing with yeah, one yeah. of the two, Daffy's bringing the game, beer, right? Game. Yes, for sure. Like, Donald's playing by the rules, and Daffy's yes. like, nah, man. I, I got I got cigars and beer. So if you were to go back to when you were in college and finals week arrives and it was always the best when you had like, if you were the one that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm done by Thursday of week one of finals. There was nothing worse than when you had that one final that was like a week after everything else. And so you're just like hanging in limbo and you know, you have this one last test still waiting for you, right? Yes. But freshman year, I was the only one left in the dorm. Basically it's the worst right now. The other side of it is this. There is always a final that because you have done well in the class and you are prioritizing your geology final or the blue book essay you have to do or whatever it might be, you're like, you know, I'm okay on this one, so I I didn't study as hard for it, and you kind of walk your way through that final. It almost sneaks up on you. For the Indiana Pacers last night, that was a game that, let's be real, is one of those finals that, like, there has been so much emphasis on other games that you're saying to yourself, like, okay, what is going to happen here? Are they going to buckle down? And the reality is they did last night what they needed to do, and that's the good news. They did not sleepwalk their way through one of their last three finals, and yeah, there's probably a lot of focus or attention on, like, you want to finish strong at home, but they need to go 2-1. and one. Now, Eddie, you had listed for us all of the different scenarios. Bottom line is if they win two of the last three, they've got one out of the way. So they've got to win one of their last two, and they essentially, for all intent and purposes, stay as the sixth seed, right? Correct. Now they just have to win one. Now there is, like, that 1% scenario where if Orlando – the Pacers, I think it has to specifically be Miami. If those three are in a tie, then the Pacers would then fall to the seventh seed because of tiebreaker because Orlando has a tiebreaker over both teams. Is it also still true that if the Pacers win out because they have a matchup with Cleveland still, they get the five? That is correct. There's still the avenue of the four, I believe, as well because they have the head-to-head over the New York Knicks. So if they tied with the Knicks, they have the head-to-head over them. The only team the Pacers don't have the head-to-head over, tiebreaker-wise, is Orlando. They have it over to New York. They have it over uh, Miami. And they have it with a win on Friday over Cleveland. Good news for Indiana last night is that they got a win, and they got a win by doing something that was what they were doing when they were, like, living on the high hog. When the Pacers were the talk of the NBA, when the Pacers were getting ready to play in the – in-season tournament championship when the basketball world was sitting there on a December day Purdue and Alabama were playing at four in the afternoon and then everything shifted to let's turn on the national pundits all sitting around talking about the in-season tournament championship as a standalone game and it looked like the NBA finals and all the talk was about Tyrese Halliburton high level of play high flying offense yeah Buddy Hill's not here anymore but 
Halliburton last night, kind of back to Tyrese Halliburton, right? Doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be from here on out. But it was good to see the fact that he's scoring. He's, you know, he's got a little bit of skip in his step again. And then how about Obi Toppin? Human highlight reel, right? Yeah, I mean, he he was amazing, and the the balance that you saw, because I'll be honest, you talk about the finals analogy. It looked like in that first quarter that this was a team that was going to sleepwalk through the final, right? They get outscored, they get outplayed in the first 35-25, and they respond with two highlight-filled second and third quarters, 40 points apiece. Uh, looking at just Obi Toppin in general, his ability to – no one's going to fill up Buddy Heald's role. But we've talked about this many times since that trade went down. Where were the three-point opportunities going to come from? Who was going to fill the void of the absence of three-point shots? Not necessarily be Buddy Heald and be as high level of a shot creator as Heald can be. But where was the volume going to come from? And you've seen Obi Toppin, including last night, step up with some great highlights mixed in as well. Another sensational night from TJ McConnell off the bench. He trips in 17. But you're right, Jake. The key ingredient to all of this, and yes, it's good to see a night where Pascal Siakam is held under 20, but it's a comfortable win because role players played well and because you got another solid game, as you mentioned, from Miles Turner. But Tyrese Halliburton is the big litmus test, if you will, for where this team can go, whether it is a six seed, a five seed, whatever. He needs to be at a high level like that. I'm not saying he has to average 30 and five a night. It could easily be 25 and 10 instead. But those are the type of post-game looks that we were used to seeing in the run you're talking about. Is Tyrese Halliburton effortlessly in the flow of an offense, having a night where he can distribute at will, having a night where he's confident offensively, and having a night where everything appears to be going the Pacers way. Now, that said, that's the type of performance that I want to see against Cleveland on Friday from Tyrese Halliburton. So I don't want to take anything away from this, but you should have beat the Raptors. You did, but you should have beat the Raptors. You talked about that on Monday. Of the three games they had left, there's two left now, two of them were against teams you have no business losing to. Trey Young be damned. I don't care. I don't care that he is potentially making his return either today or tomorrow. And he would be likely available if that's where the trend goes for the Sunday finale at Cambridge. You should take care of business against bad teams. As we go to the next checklist, Cleveland is a good team. They're a playoff team. And they're standing in your way of locking up further padding within your seating in the playoffs. This should be the same song and dance that we just saw last night, but against better competition on the road. And it would fit more towards my theory of if you're Rick Carlisle, you're treating this just like the in-season tournament. These should be single elimination games in your mind, playoff-like atmosphere within both the stadiums you go to and your locker room itself so that you are ready to go when the playoffs start here in about, what, seven, eight days. Uh, that is, by the way, the voice of Jimmy Cook. My name is Jake Query. Eddie Garrison, you heard from earlier. This is Query and Company on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan, thanks for joining us on this Hump Day Wednesday. Big show lined up. James Boyd going to join us coming up bottom of the hour. From The Athletic, we'll talk a little bit about the Colts, but the Pacers as well. Uh, then at 1 o'clock, speaking of the Pacers, we'll focus on, again, this playoff picture. Scott Agnes going to join us, Fieldhouse Files. 2 o'clock, Will Haskett. He'll be joining us from Augusta. Donald Duck lining up on a par 3. Do they have par 3s at Augusta? They do. Does every course yeah, have a par 3? I mean, I can't blanketly say that, but I would say yes. It's fair to assume most courses do have at least one par 3. People love the Masters, don't they? Absolutely. Are you it. all in on the oh, Masters? Yeah, I have, oh, man. Do you want me to spoil it now, or do you want me to wait till tomorrow? Right, go ahead. Got bringing in a pimento cheese sandwich tomorrow, Jake. I'm all in. Let's go. Okay. It, it, was that $2? Isn't that what that cost? <laughs> I wish it was $2. It was four fifty to buy the you know buy the cheese spread at Meyer. Shout out to Meyer. I think- uh, Not a sponsor. Aren't they like $2 at- at, yeah, yeah, famously Augusta the National. cheapest concessions, like $1.52 bucks for- My only thing there. that I can tell you about the Masters Have you been? is that- I've never been to the okay. Masters. That's a, is it a bucket list for you? Because I would like to go. That's, no. Okay. All right. No interest whatsoever? Not really. Even the final round? I respect it. it All right. Okay. That's fine. I'm just curious. Doesn't do anything for me. All right. I mean, I, I, I'll i watch it. You know what I mean? I I just feel like if you're, because you're a big sports fan like all three of us, that maybe a final round at Augusta would be a bucket you know, list atmosphere type thing. No, I get it. And I, I understand. I, I get all of it. 
Um, and, and my dad and my sister notably are massive, massive golf fans. Um, one of the things that, and this is going to sound crazy, but one of the things that I think is a little bit different, and most of my friends that are avid golfers love the Masters, don't get me wrong, but the Masters has always been, always, Jimmy, a massive deal. No question about it. It has been, for years, in the era of wide world of sports, that's what I always say, in the pre-cable sports television era, so back in the caveman days, right? Um, after we went out and, and clubbed an elk and dragged it back home for dinner, there were basically like five sporting events that were back when people actually sat around the dinner table as a family and ate dinner that were dinner table conversations. And that was Wimbledon, the Indianapolis 500, the Kentucky Derby, the Masters. Uh, those are the ones that come to mind. And then probably like World Series. So in other words, like you sat down and even if you were not a fan of those sports, it was, hey, who won such and such today? And that's what the networks showed you. And the Masters was certainly one of them, no doubt about it. But the rest of the PGA Tour, and I'm talking about in 1985, 1990, up to 1995 probably, the rest of the PGA Tour was not as big as it is now because it was pre-Tiger Woods. So everyone watched the Masters. Everybody watched the Majors, right? But like the BMW Open or the, you know, something in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, on a Sunday afternoon in April, you didn't have as many people watching because you didn't have the stars. I mean, Nicholas, Nicholas was a star. Greg Norman was a star, but nothing like, of course, Tiger Woods, yeah. right? So so you had the gateway drug that, that my era did not necessarily have oh, yeah. to Tiger get you involved just a shot and interested. Oh, right. yeah. I mean, you, you were he was the epicenter mm -hmm. of sports during the time that you were learning sports. So I certainly understand yeah. why it is more enrooted and invested in you. I, I mean, I... I get it, but it would be disingenuous for me. I don't want to lie to people. There I, I respect to that. say that, like you know, oh man, uh, you know. Now I just I have, view all of this as the here's the fast track of spring sports. We go NCAA tournament, we go Masters week for sure. The base, Masters, ba no question. Baseball regular season's ongoing. If that's your cup of tea, but then NBA playoffs start. The Derby kicks off May, and then we have the race to the 500, and then we're off and running. Yeah, like, I, I, I just that. love the back to back to back events. Without question, for years, the promos for the Masters during the NCAA tournament let you know that you were, in fact, making the transition and closing the door on yeah. winter for yep. sure. Now, the, and I know, I mean, it, and look, the talent of the player, I mean, it's all unbelievable. I get it. And the beauty of it and the, 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 the calming nature of it all, I, I totally get all of it. Um, the, the thing about the Masters itself, you know, the traditions of it, I you can't deny, right? There are some traditions of it that are kind of ugly about Augusta National. Yeah. I mean, yep. that's been well documented. I don't need to sit here and, and bring that back up. But, but I do know this. My buddy, a friend of mine from high school, lived in Augusta, Georgia for two or three years. He lives in Macon now. But what is fascinating is, I mean, he he would talk all the time about back before like Airbnb, so to speak, people that live in Augusta basically pay their mortgage for the year by renting their homes out to the players of the Masters. And I think he rented his out. It wasn't like to a mainstay player, but I mean like, I don't know, like $12,000 or something for a week, like twenty five grand for two weeks. Now, I mean, they, ridiculous, right? You think they're keeping Airbnb afloat that way or uh, is that uh, independently done? Under the table stuff. Uh, okay. Under uh, the table okay. stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um so, By the way, I'm not a, like, to borrow a religious term, there's something that they call Catholics, that's what I grew up, that only, like, participate in major events within the church calendar year, Christmas and Easter. Right, of course. Priesters is usually what that's called. Right. Uh, that's where I view myself with golf. Like, I'll follow it casually, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend I have the knowledge of, like, Will Haskin, who covers the tour. I just love the majors. I love the Masters. I love the U.S. Open. I love the PGA Championship. I love the Open Championship. I love stakes, and that's what the – majors bring you i'm not outside of the waste management open i'm not like locking in for four days for you know uh four round action in it's a caucus i don't even know if they play there so john calipari took a pay cut to go to arkansas right mm -hmm. so he's at a place where he leaves 
to go to what is deemed, even though a, you know a well-known, but probably a lesser program than Kentucky, for less money, and most would assume that he was doing so because he saw that the time was getting close for him in Lexington. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that he felt like it started with the athletic director, and I'm blanking this on his name. This sounds like stuff we're familiar with. Yes, it does. It does for certain. Their athletic director basically came out and like was non-fully committal on what happened with Kentucky this year with Coach Cal, but just that he would be back for a 16th season. And I think at that point, with the fan base turning, with a feel of not full support from the athletic department, Coach Cal wanted to control the narrative and control things on his terms, and Arkansas happened to be open because of the domino effect that we outlined yesterday. I think part of it, Jimmy, and I realize that we're doing a sports talk radio show in Indianapolis, so talking about John Calipari and the University of Kentucky is probably not our P1 listening audience. I, I, I get that. But I think this goes back to just sports in general. And something interesting that happens in sports, sports does not represent real life in all ways. It does in some. One of the ways that sports represents real life is in the real world, Oftentimes now, you see people that are the most successful, and by successful I mean the American definition of it. They have the most money, they're in power positions, they're they're insulated from critique, etc. Usually those people have a resume that looks like a CVS receipt because they bounce around a lot. And the reason they bounce around a lot is not necessarily always because they're unhappy or unsettled, but because they're looking around the corner at all times. And in addition to that, they are oftentimes people of great success. The reason that they reach the success that they do is because they are constantly challenging themselves. Not necessarily about challenging others, but they are always needing something that is driving and fueling them. And if they get somewhere where they're living on the high hog and from the outside it looks like they have everything that is coming to them, internally what got them to that point all of a sudden needs more paper thrown onto the brush fire to, to, to enrage it again. And so sometimes it's like, you know what, I just got to do something different because I'm too content. And I think that's partially what you see here. Calipari's time at Kentucky, while fantastic, it got him one title. People at Kentucky would expect in that time three to four. But – this is somebody who is driven by his own challenge. And then you can say, well, he's not loyal. That's my favorite thing in sports. He's not loyal. Now, I am a big believer in loyalty personally, right? I love loyalty. I've talked about it on the show that I love loyalty. But I'm talking about loyalty to friends, loyalty to things like that. When it comes to, like, life situations, the reality is this. I like to say that I'm always loyal to places where I've worked and et cetera. But when it comes to sports, oftentimes coaches get critiqued or players get critiqued from going from one situation to the next. And they get critiqued by those of us that are not in the world of sports. And the thing that we hang our hat on is I haven't switched jobs around because I'm loyal. Oftentimes loyalty is defined by options. You know, a guy that has worked the same job for 30 years that does a good job and is a good employee, and don't get me wrong, and goes in and punches the clock and goes home every day, but the reality is that guy probably doesn't have a lot of people that are regularly calling him seeing if, they, if he wants to leave his 30-year job to go to another. And so he doesn't make the money of a John Calipari or he doesn't make the money of, you know, insert – professional athlete that he's upset at for moving from one place to the next. And so what does he do? He doesn't have a lot that that actually connects him to the players or the coaches that he admires. And so in order to feel some sort of like a kinship or then later a superiority over it, he says, well, at least I'm loyal. I can't root for that guy anymore because he's not loyal. I wouldn't do that. I've worked the same job for 30 years. Well, how many people came along and knocked on the door and asked you if you wanted to leave it to make three times more across the street? Well, nobody. Well, that's why you're loyal. 
your loyalty is as, is as defined as your options. And in John Calipari's case, there are two reasons oftentimes that a coach leaves. I mean, one of them is there's indiscretions and they're going to get fired. But it's usually either A, their loyalty is to their family and they have a chance to put them in even better position and so they opt for another place. Or B, they fuel themselves and they chase those contracts by challenging themselves internally. And Calipari probably felt to Kentucky like he'd run out of challenges. He, It had become stale. And so this is a new challenge. Do you think it was more challenges that he wanted new variety? Do you think it was because of he felt that he was going to get run out of town? Or well, do you think it was a combination of both? A combination of both. I, I do think that. Because I feel like that did play a role of him seeing the writing on the wall. There's no question that that Kentucky the, – the only – probably the reason Calipari was still at Kentucky from Kentucky's standpoint was the contract, yeah. right? Yeah, it's the lifetime deal. Yep. But he knew – so he could have stayed if he wanted to, but it was going through the motions. It was just rinse and repeat. Arkansas is a new challenge, and Arkansas is a place where you can win. I mean, clearly, Eric Musselman won there. I, they knocked out Kansas a year ago. Went to a couple sweet 16s. They – Arkansas is a top 25 program historically. I mean, Eddie Sutton coached there. Nolan Richardson coached there. National championships have been won there. Lottery picks have come out of there. SEC championships have come out of there. Multiple Final Fours have come out of there. And you are still in a pretty good recruiting area. I mean, Khalil Ware, who just had a fabulous season for Indiana, or at least a very good season for Indiana, and at times fabulous. What's his home state? He's from Arkansas. Like, there, there are good players that come out of that area. And then, of course, Calipari's a national brand anyway. I mean, how many guys that Calipari got to Kentucky are from Kentucky, right? You watch. Now, that leads to the other half of this, which is which we'll get into probably over the course of the week. We can keep our eyes on it. The transfer portal is basically like the merry-go-round until finally somebody throws up, right? And, and it's easy to be the one that's on there that's like, I got, I've, got to get, I've got to get off. I'm getting nauseous because it's spinning all over the place and it's impossible to keep a hold of. But Kentucky's going to have, you know, they have mainstay big-time players that are committed to Kentucky that are now looking to go elsewhere and players on the roster that are not going pro that are going to be looking to go elsewhere. So you have incoming freshmen that are available. You have players that were there that are available. You would assume some of those may go to Arkansas. Then you have Indiana State, who just obviously kind of captured the imagination and the spirit of this state by their level of play, their unselflessness and getting into the NIT final. And that entire roster is getting ready to enter into the portal, right? So, and I think one of them, I mean, I think Indiana's going to look at anybody that can shoot threes, Indiana's going to look at it. And one of them is in Terre Haute and is a local player. We'll see what happens there. Um, but half that roster may also just go to I, on I-70 to St. Louis, Jimmy. Like, it's there are dominoes in college basketball that are fascinating to watch. I feel like if we're going vomit-inducing, it has to be tilt-a-whirl, right? I don't think of a carousel as where I'm going to go. Ooh. I mean, tilt-a-whirl for sure, but, man, like a, a merry-go-round? Well, I you, mean, I, granted, it's been about five years since I've been on one, but I don't remember high Eddie, stakes Eddie, did you ever puke on a merry-go-round? On a merry-go-round. No. I'm not talking about the carousel with the little horsey going up and down. I'm talking about the merry-go-round where oh yeah, uh, your okay. soft generation, they probably didn't exist. No. You probably didn't have merry-go-rounds. You didn't have the witch's hat, right? <laughs> I, I, did you have monkey bars? I have, I, we're talking about on a schoolyard playground. I understand. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I got lost in carnival themes. Yeah, My you, always get that one, you yep. always get the one jackass kid that's like he's, yes. got, he's got a hold of that thing and like the Quentin Nelson of the group, yeah, and he's, he's running just, as fat. Yeah. Correct. And then diving he's in. Spinning, yes, that's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. right. Yes, yep. One kid starts to fall off, and he's getting dragged behind, and everybody's like, whoa, stop. And then... One kid just gets whoopsie, and he goes and throws up, and then the janitor comes and brings the goldfish cracker bag out with sawdust on it and pours <laughs> it on there on the on the desk, and then the, the fun's over for everybody until tomorrow. Yes. I also, now that we've clarified it and I remembered what a merry-go-round is, I also did not puke uh, to back Eddie up in that regard. Now, merry-go-round also was an awesome clothing store in the mall right next to Spencer Gifts where if you really played it smart, you could go in and look at some guest jeans and then walk into Spencer Gifts and catch yourself a glimpse of a Heather Locklear poster. That was a good Saturday. Head over and get yourself a hot Sam pretzel. I'm telling you, man, those were the days. James Boyd is with The Athletic. He will mercifully save us. We'll talk a little Colts and Pacers both with him next. Hey, it's Andy Sweeney for Universe.
David Bowie version versus Vanilla Ice. Yeah. Probably a good call because is Chris Ballard under pressure? Is that what we're saying? Yes, sir. Nah, he's good. He drafted Anthony Richardson. He's still got like three years. I would agree with that. He but he just he punted that can another five years, right? Yeah, I say that with not a lot of happiness, but hey, it's all right. I mean, hey, good for him, right? Yeah, hey. Got to respect it. Game recognized game, baby. Uh, James Boyd, no stranger to the program, joins us now from The Athletic talking about the NFL draft and the Colts. He has been previewing some of the possibilities for Indianapolis. Joins us on the show. James, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. All right, let's get right to this. Uh, When you are looking through, I, I guess the first question I would have is when looking through the Colts prospects in the draft, let's say pre combine to now, in your opinion, has there been any wind of change in terms of areas that they may be targeting or areas that they now feel maybe are more shallow that they have needs and so therefore they need to address early as opposed to waiting until rounds three or four? Or do you think it's been a pretty consistent board throughout? I think it's been pretty consistent. However, I probably was leaning more towards offense before this first wave of free agency. But now they haven't signed a cornerback. I'm like, they probably are going to pick a cornerback in the first round. That's my, I guess, leaning. I'm not reporting anything. But I just feel like if you haven't upgraded that that position at all, betting on Dallas Flowers and Jalen Jones to be one of the answers is not a bet I'm willing to place. I would much rather go draft uh, Quinion Mitchell or Tyrion Arnold or someone in the first round who could start from day one and be a guy. James Boyd is our guest, covers the Colts for the Athletic. James, we always give you time to plug your stuff, but I'm going to do it early on the front end here because you retweeted something that always gets me jacked for NFL draft time, and that is, of course, if you have a subscription to the Athletic, and if you don't, you can get James's work, and plus you can get one of his colleagues, Dane Brugler, who every year puts out The Beast, which goes through Every single position, in-depth breakdowns of not just team-centric guys, but we're talking the entire draft class from one all the way down to Mr. Irrelevant. So I want to phrase it this way, James. It's been four hours since he posted it, so let's assume that you've got a chance to look at some of it, even briefly. Where did you first go as a Colts beat writer? Did you go wide receiver? Did you go tight end? Did you look at cornerbacks? What was the first section of the beast that drew James Boyd, beat writer for the Indianapolis Colts, two. I went to the cornerbacks because I figured that's their biggest position of need. And, of course, I know the top guys, but I'm looking at, okay, who could be someone they get if they trade back or if they don't go cornerback round one, who's someone in round two or three that they could possibly pick up. Because I do think that they're ultimately going to draft a cornerback on day one or day two. So I went there first, but – even then, I think reading some of the background of these guys is always pretty um, intriguing to me. You know, re- reading about Brian Thomas Jr., who I think is a great player and will be a great pick for the Colts. He actually wasn't allowed to play football as a freshman. And his family, you know, forced him to play basketball because he was too skinny. And I'm like, uh, I guess it worked out for you because he went back to football. And now you're going to be a, you know, a first-round pick. So things like that is always interesting to me is reading little nuggets that I probably um, can't Google or can't find on a stat sheet. James Boyd is our guest from The Athletic. James, the guy that has been the most consistent from day one in terms of if he was on the board, the Colts would take him. And I want you to tell me, let's just say hypothetically, Chris Ballard's sitting there, clock's ticking, they're waiting for the card to turn in, and he's looking at it, and the best corner that he deems available is there, and Bowers, the tight end from Georgia, is there. He's writing down what? Ooh, that's a good question. I'd probably say Bowers. I'd probably say Bowers. See, to me, it comes down to this, and I think you and I might have talked about this when you were in when Jimmy was out losing his mortgage in Las Vegas. But <laughs> we the, went um, black. We went in the black. Okay, fair Dang enough. It. The um, at some point, doesn't the strategy become James? If you have two players of need that are essentially that need is a tie, the tiebreaker should be which one has the greatest drop-off between themselves and what would be available at that position in the next round? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. That so, makes sense. And, and and at tight end, it seems – like, for example, the way I always say it, if Bowers is a 9 and a tight end that you would get in round 2 is an 8.2, you have a difference of a 0.8, 
and the best corner available is a nine, but you can get a corner in round two that's an 8.7, then you go with tight end, correct? Because you have less drop-off. Which of those right. positions, I guess, would be the one that is deeper? I think that in this position, it will probably be, you know, if you're leaning towards cornerback or wide receiver, they're probably a little bit deeper than it would be for tight end. Um, but I think it also goes back to how you would build your team and how much you trust Shane Spiken to work with whatever you give him. And I think if you give him a tight end like Brock Bowers, if he's still available, of course, that's someone I could see thriving in this system. And also, I think his floor is pretty high as well. I know you don't draft players that high for their floor, but I'm saying that because, to me, there's very little room for him to be like a completely not good player. I think his feeling is obviously to be a superstar, a great tight end, you know, perennial pro bowler. But, like, his floor to me is to still be a really good player who might make one or two Pro Bowls, something like that. So um, that's always a factor in my head. James, it felt like the way things were trending in negotiations with different teams from Julian Blackman that in all likelihood a reunion with the Colts, we talked about this last week, in a one-year variety would likely be the ultimate play that happens. It does happen that way. $7.7 $7.7 million is the contract value, $3.2 million guaranteed. Where do you imagine things went from a negotiation standpoint with Blackman to get to this point, and why is it a opportune situation for both sides on just a one-year deal that's likely a prove-it-get-me-over deal for Blackman to sign elsewhere? I think that early on, and he talks about this a little bit, but you expect your free agency to go one way. And then we saw this mass exodus of safeties and a few of them were surprising. Like, you know, Justin Simmons got cut. Now it was purely monetary, but he was cut after a second team all pro season. And he's been, I believe a four time all pro in his career. So it's not like he's tapering off. He's 30, he's getting older, but that was a bit surprising. So when he hits the market, when you have Kyle Duggar, when you have, um, you know, other big time safeties, that saturates the market and it creates a smaller market for you personally because you're kind of waiting for these other guys to get snapped up or get picked up and you can't um, maybe get what you would have wanted to because teams aren't as desperate to go after you because they have other options. And so I think that he was maybe a bit taken aback by that. And then it became a matter of, okay, I've talked to other teams. Um, they're not offering me the long-term deal that maybe I would want so if I'm going to bet on myself, I'll bet on myself with the team that just proved that they can use me and I can use them to have a great season. And so I think it goes two ways, like you said, Jimmy, where, you know, the Colts, in my opinion, you know, another year of him in this system. And really it's just like, can he stay up? Can he stay healthy for 17 games for a full season? If he can't, then they have an answer on their end as to what do they want to do for their future? Yes, he's 25, but do you want to continue to, you know, bet on the guy who, you know, historically hasn't always been the healthiest in certain times of the season. And then for Julian, it's like, if I do prove that I can stay healthy for an entire year, play well again, then maybe I've earned your trust enough or earned someone's trust enough around the league to command a multi-year contract. Because he said yesterday, um, I believe I'm worth more than a one-year deal. James, do you believe with Chris Ballard, James Boyd, our guest from The Athletic, I think one of the things that would be difficult in that position is the reality is you've got to block out the noise. And Chris Ballard has a job that it's a great job. He's very healthy compensation, but everybody is is under the assumption they can do the job to his level, if not better, right? Human yeah, nature dictates all of us within human nature, James. All of us are driven at times by doubters and proving those doubters wrong, right? But yeah. you have to have a fine balance of not – having that be the motivating factor in a decision. Do you believe that Chris Ballard, I guess, has the right balance of blocking out those distractions? And is there any chance he is somebody that could be fueled or driven or misguided by overcoming naysayers and the motivation thereof? I don't think that he would lean so far into that. Um, Mainly because, I mean, I've had conversations with him both on and off the record about things that I've written or said about him, and 
you know, he could be a guy that, you know, looks at me like I'm crazy. Like, what is this guy writing about? He's never done the job before. But I think that there's always been a two-way street to him understanding, okay, this is why I'm being criticized because I haven't done X, Y, Z. And so I do think that you can be motivated by that. But at the end of the day, I think that he's motivated by his own pitfalls, if you will, in this role. Again, no matter how you slice it, no matter what you look at in this league, most of the time, I say most of the time because there are exceptions to the rule depending on, you know, relationships, things like that. But most of the time, 90% of the time, you're judged off your record, what you've done on Sundays and on game days. And for him, again, you don't have the division title. You have the two playoff appearances. You have one playoff win during the first seven years of your tenure. And at some point, that's going to eat at you more than what anybody else could say because they're saying these things because of that, if that makes sense. Like, it's not a, you know, it's not like we're jumping out and saying random things about you. We're saying this because it's a byproduct of what you've done or what you've lacked to accomplish during your tenure. James, where do they go from here in terms of mapping out the rest of the draft after that first round pick? Because we know that it's either going to go, I mean, offensive or defensive seems to broad, but we know it's likely to be if Bowers is there or if they go high level corner, that's their first round pick. As you look at what they were able to do in free agency and what the rest of the draft board will unfold for them, where is your biggest need in, in any particular order? Yeah, so I look at the different needs. Obviously, the the three big ones, in my opinion, would be, you know, cornerback, wide receiver, and edge rusher. And I get it. I've gotten some pushback. Like, oh, what do you mean, edge rusher? We need a safety, all these things. I look at what the great, great teams do, and they all usually have an elite edge rusher. Obviously, um, it helps to have a really, you know, great cornerback, really great wide receiver, but I would lean more towards edge rusher even still being a need over safety because you saw the safety market this past offseason where teams are willing to kind of sure up that position with players that might be on one- or two-year deals or take a swing on a, a draft pick, whatever the case may be. They don't value that position as much as they do for an edge rusher, and obviously we see that with the competition and how guys get paid. So I think their board probably shakes out, you know, after those big three. You could always use more, you know, offensive line depth. You can always use – another, uh, you know, depth guy, the defensive line. But I look at, I didn't look at linebacker. I think that they're top-heavy with their linebackers. But if you can get another guy in there um, with, for example, EJ Speed is becoming a free agent next summer, if you can get a guy in here that could, um, you know, possibly replace him or, you know, work in tandem with him depending on what you do with his contract, if you get another, cor- uh, I think, linebacker in there that can cover, um, add some relief, that's a good decision. I think that Chris Bell has been a good linebacker drafter throughout his career. And so I look at some of those needs throughout this team, and that kind of piques my interest. But, again, for me, I'm, I'm kind of just waiting and seeing what they do at cornerback. And if they pick a cornerback early, because if they don't, that means they're going to bet on Jalen Jones or Dallas Flowers. And, again, um, if you bet on them and they hit Chris Ballard, I will write how genius of a move it was. But if you don't, um, I think you're going to hear a lot of criticism about that. James, is there a position – James Boyd, our guest from The Athletic, is there a position that – it may people may be surprised that the Colts kind of stockpile late in the draft that you're going to go, wait a minute, they seem good at that position, but that Chris Ballard might have the foresight that they are a year or two from some people falling out of cycle, contractually, health-wise, whatever it may be, where they know they're ultimately going to have to have a couple of reserves, if you will, ready to go. And so, therefore, that security may come rounds five, six, seven this year, and it would surprise people. What area would that be? That's a good question. I think that one of them, like I said, will probably be linebacker. Even though you're not in some, like, danger zone, you know, your linebacker core is getting a little bit older, um, and you wonder, okay, what is our ceiling with this group? I think another one that's kind of been underrated is the running back position. Obviously, we have Jonathan Taylor. Um, Chris Ballard said he expects a huge year from him um, because he's finally going to be healthy. Obviously, no contract issue, things like that. But who's his backup? Are you sure it's going to be Trey Sermon? Or do you are you okay with that? Or do you you know are you okay with Evan Hull coming back from a season injury last year? Or do you look at maybe adding another you know running back that can catch out of the backfield or add a little bit more to that room, give a little more diversity? Um, I'm curious to see what they do at that position for sure because I think that Zach Moss was an underrated loss. Totally agree. I totally sure. agree. Because, 
let's just say hypothetically, James, I, you know, knock on wood, but if Jonathan Taylor has to miss some time or some reps, that was such a valuable piece, right? Because you didn't miss a lot, and he kind of gave you a different look, a different wrinkle, if you will. Um, you know, that now falls on who? If, if Taylor's not there, that falls on who? That falls on Trey Sermon right now. I think that he's the projected backup. When I look at the the, the roster, um, I wouldn't trust, you know, Hull, Evan Hull to be the backup after not playing, you know, hardly at all last year. I think he appeared in one game. Obviously, Tyler Goods is still on the roster, but I wouldn't expect him to be your number two running back. And so, yeah, Trey Sermon gets a lot of that, that workload. But, again, he's kind of been a journeyman who really hasn't had it all come together in a season. So I wonder if the Colts would think about, you know, on day three, drafting a running back they know because they could plug in there right away and he could be productive. So I'm curious about that. And also, again, just on a tangent, I do expect JT to bounce back, but you do wonder, okay, for the past two years, he's kind of been dinged up. And, of course, you expect him still at a very young age, I think he's 25, to, you know, be healthy, be productive, but just – common sense would tell you the older you get the position he plays the likelihood of him getting healthier later is not likely and so you have to you know build in some contingency plans just in case again he has to miss an extended period of time james you highlighted half of my last question for you jonathan taylor's injury history or the the fear of him getting injured combined with anthony richardson's short history but albeit injury filled rookie season that was the tandem that was expected going into last year to electrify the Colts offense and keep teams guessing because if you run option or whatever with those two guys, uh, what, what poison are you picking? Do you imagine that style is tempered back due to both of those injury concerns with both players we outlined? I don't think so because I think that if you do that, you're going to limit what you can become. And I'm not saying you go out there and you'd be reckless. You have to be calculated. You have to be smart. But, again, you can't take yourself out of the running before you see what you're capable of, in my opinion. And all that to say is some fancy way of saying, give the ball to your best players and trust that they can lift this team. Because you look at, again, this offseason, you haven't made really any changes. The only change you're expecting or you're betting on is for Anthony Richardson to come back, be fully healthy, play the entire season, and take a significant leap, and then also JT come back, be fully healthy, play the majority of the season, hopefully the entire season, and make that jump together because I know we've hyped up, you know, Houston, I've done it, the additions they've made, the Titans, the Jaguars are still there. For the Colts, your biggest offseason additions have been your two main players just being healthy and being available and hopefully getting some time to practice together because, I mean, you look at, what they did last year, I think that JT and Anthony Richardson were on the field for two snaps together last year. That's it. And obviously they didn't practice hardly together, no training camp. So you just wonder, with both of them being healthy, no contract disputes, can they build some chemistry and then build um, with this team and, and try to go for it? Because um, I think that this is a window that is, you know, dwindling a little bit, not, you know, tiny, not, you're not the Jaguars with, you know, uh, Trevor Lawrence going to the final year of his rookie deal. But, again, you do want to have some urgency and try to go for it. And, again, The Athletic is where you can read all of James' work. You go to the NFL tab and then under Teams for the Colts, all of the articles, including the Colts' pre-draft depth chart look from James, an article about Anthony Richardson and what the Colts are doing to build him up as other teams in the AFC South lift their quarterbacks, and then, of course, draft previews as well. James, appreciate the time as always. And inevitably, and um, inevitably is the wrong way of saying it, but surely we'll talk to you between now and the draft. Appreciate it. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right, James Boyd of The Athletic. By the way, talk a little Pacers coming up top of the hour, but something very interesting, a little bit of foreshadowing perhaps in the world of sports in what would be a major, major, major story in Indianapolis. Might have just happened about five miles from where I'm sitting right now. I'll let you know what that is next. What if the next time you painted your home was the last?
done your taxes, Jimmy Cook? Yes, all good. Eddie Garrison, you done your taxes? Yes, sir. Okay. That's due in what, within the week here? Jake, have you done Five yours? Five days. I have, thank you. Five days, right? I April went like 15? three rounds on it, but yes, I got it done. That's still the standard day? April I'm like 15th. Colonel Parker. I, I pay like the absolute most because I'm always terrified. So I'm like, just take whatever. I, you're fine. Great. <laughs> but when I did my taxes, of course, uh, that means two things. Number one, it means that I have a, and I always forget if it's a W-2, W-9, WD-40, whatever it is. like the. Don't think it's the last one. Auxiliary paperwork. Um, well, but you're trying to grease some things. Hey. Um, thank you. I have one from, of course, uh, IndyCar Radio, and when tax time comes, it means that May is almost here, and the Indianapolis 500 will be here before we know it. There is a two-day test going on at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and session number one is complete. Now, what will be taking place, and I have not been outside, so I'm not sure what the weather is currently, but you still have rookie orientation to take place for Kiffin Simpson, Christian Rasmussen, Nolan Siegel, Pietro Fittipaldi. That would be a refresher the other three would be refresher. Pietro Fittipaldi, Marco Andretti, and Catherine Legg. Uh, Jake, that's great. R- what are you talking about exactly? Well, let me explain. If you are a rookie at the Indianapolis 500, or if you are deemed to be a veteran in need of a refresher, meaning that you have not been in an Indy car for a certain number of laps or races since the last Indy 500, you go through an observed session for the rookies, for example, where they have to do laps at speed intervals, so many of them like at under 190, so many between 190 and 200, so many between 200 and I think like 215, and then after that, like all clear above 215. And you're driving coaches, essentially, people like you know Ari Leyendike, Max Pappas. They watch your line, they watch where you're going, and they, they give you the seal of approval to then go out in the wild, if you will. And those three veterans, Pietro Fittipaldi, Marco Andretti, Catherine Legg, have yet to go through that, unless they are right now. Kiffin Simpson, Christian Rasmussen, and Nolan Siegel have to go through that for the rookie orientation before they get cleared. When the month proceeds and we get more into the weeds about the Indy 500, I'll tell the story of the only driver, the only, there is only one who has ever run the Indianapolis 500 without having to go through a rookie orientation. That is there's only one driver that has done that, and there were unique circumstances that led to it. But I digress. In terms of today, in the full session for IndyCar veterans and Indianapolis 500 veterans, the top speed of the day so far, 228.811 miles an hour, turned in by the defending winner, Joseph Newgarden. Scott Dixon was at 226.3, followed by Alex Pillow, Scott McLaughlin, Santino Ferrucci, Renus VK, Marcus Armstrong, Linus Lundquist, and Felix Rosenquist. Those were the drivers in, um, in the top ten. Now, that's only nine drivers. That is because I did not mention who was the second fastest. 226.384 miles an hour. Now, there are rookies that went through the session today who have already gone through rookie orientation previously. Those are Marcus Armstrong, Linus Lundquist, who I mentioned, Tom Blumquist, who was 16th fastest today, and the second fastest of the day at 226.384 miles an hour for McLaren, Aero McLaren Racing, and that is Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson, the second fastest. And if you remember when all of the hub hub about Fernando Alonso coming over and running the Indianapolis 500 and all of the attention on whether or not now Kyle Larson is going to be able to win Indy and do the double and everything else, I'm telling you right now, so long as he has clean pit stops and they give him a car that runs in the top 10 or 12 in speed, Kyle Larson will absolutely, absolutely be in the thick. And there is no reason after one session to believe that's not going to be the case. No, that's because of him, right? As talented of a driver he is or the team both but his talent is in terms of natural oval talent and driver craft he is as good as anybody that is in that field would you compare him to like cj stroud i would compare him to well above cj stroud okay i was just trying to think of an nfl comparison quarterback wise um because we do this all the time Peyton manning andrew luck okay in terms of natural ability and put him anywhere right cj stroud's a wonderful player don't get me wrong but cj stroud probably and, and in racing also you need a good team around you but Kyle Larson, you could put Kyle Larson in a tricycle 
and within five minutes, he's going to figure out how to get that tricycle around a track based on a line that no other kid has figured out. That's just his natural ability. But second fastest today, 226-384. Scott Agnes next. Attention landowners. Got big plans for your land. Pacers with a big win last night over the Toronto Raptors to firmly continue control of their destiny for a six-seed or better finish to the NBA regular season heading into the playoffs. 141-23 winners over the Toronto Raptors covering it all as he joins us quite a bit here on these airways is Scott Agnes of Fieldhouse Files. Scott, how are you? Hey, Jimmy. Good to be on with you. Can't believe the final week of the season. Two games left. Like, that's where we're at right now. Scott, for your perspective on Tyrese Halliburton, and Jake talked about this earlier, does it feel like in your mind over the last four or five games that he is rounding back into form, whether it's more comfortability with Pascal Siakam and everybody at full strength, whether it is just him breaking out of his slump, where have you seen over the last four or five him getting back to the form that we saw so critical to their run in the play-in that would also be so critical to a deep run in the playoffs? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And I think this is more about him than others or his teammates and things like that. First of all, I think that mental blockage just from just the fatigue factor, I think is behind him. And that's in large part, uh, I think, to some days off. Like right now, uh, they're back in Indy. They won't fly out again until tomorrow, then play. And it's a short, you know, probably an hour flight, if that, to Cleveland. So a break in the schedule. No more back-to-backs here in the last couple of weeks have been helpful um, and I, you can just see it first with his body language and then with his play on the court. Um, he's smiling again. We're seeing the Halliburton skip. Those are all uh, good factors for him. And on top of that, he's starting to knock down those three-point shots. He's had two in each of the last uh, nine games now, uh, which is huge. And then last night in particular, up in Toronto, that was his best offensive performance since his injury in January several months ago. So, at the right time, he's looking as healthy as he could be probably until an offseason where he can really lay off that hamstring. It is a 46-minute in-air flight from Indianapolis to Cleveland, Scott. Do you know the only problem with that 46-minute flight from Indianapolis to Cleveland? What's that? When it ends, you're in Cleveland. That's the uh, – <laughs> I, 
Cleveland actually underrated. Cleveland's actually I underrated. Cleveland. I've, had, I've had fun times yeah. in Cleveland, actually, to be honest. With you. Yeah, Jake, I don't mind it at all. There's a nice little district that kind of reminds me of a Georgia street or a Mass app, kind of just west, I think it is, of the stadium. There's a casino opportunity. You have a baseball park right there. My only thing is that almost seemingly any time you are there, it is dark, overcast, and a little breezy. I, I'd right agree. The, the weather's water. not great. But I had a buddy that right out of college, he had a choice between working in Chicago or Cleveland. And he's like, you know what? Everybody goes to Chicago. I'll go to Cleveland. So we went and visited, and I mean, it was a cool town. We had we had fun there, to be fair, and I have good friends there. But but it's an easy city to knock on. <laughs> um, okay, Scott, I want to get into this last night and, and dive into it a little deeper. Uh, was it simply matchup situational? Was it uh, a concerted effort to uncork? What exactly got into Obi Toppin last night? Because I thought he was outstanding. Yeah, he, he really was. What I think the biggest thing was in the second half, they were getting back to their playing style, getting out and running and getting those transition points. And that's where he's out at his best. Again, that's, that is why they brought him and Bruce Brown in originally at the beginning of the season is because what they could accomplish on the run there in transition. So I think they got back to that. Um, and when the opponent like Toronto wasn't making shots and, and scoring at ease like they were in that first quarter, then you're not always taking it out of the net. And then you're, you're able to get down and play more of that full court offense. I think one area come the playoffs that will be interesting to see is what this team looks like when they, things slow down, when there's longer possessions, when you get into your half court offense, um, because that'll be, that's, that's an area that the Pacers traditionally have not been good at. That's something that Tyrese Halliburton talked about it with us at the draft combine last year is he was watching the postseason. Uh, the game has slowed down. He was texting with the assistant coaches, ways in which maybe they need to work on that. But uh, I, I think we've also seen Jake on Toppin is he's gotten more and more comfortable. Now this deep into the season with personnel, with his role in particular, I think fans would be stunned uh, to find out that he's among the Pacers' best three-point shooters on the team this season and what he's been able to do. And since the All-Star break, it's been McConnell at 60% and he at 42%. Um, that's a great thing. Now, on the other side of that, one concern also for me coming in during the postseason is you need your guards. You need those wings to knock down three-pointers, and that's something I'd like to see them work on. Scott Agnes of Fieldhouse Files is our guest. Scott, you brought up T.J. McConnell. He's been outstanding throughout the entirety of the season, but especially the last month, month and a half, where he's able to take that second unit by the horns and at times not just keep things level but extend leads for the Pacers. Why do you think, and I know Malik Monk is probably going to be the runaway winner but why do you think he has not garnered the national awards attention of six man of the year consideration? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. I wrote about that yesterday at Fieldhouse Files, how if you're watching the Pacers and understand their dynamic, you know just how critical TJ has been to this team. There's probably a handful of games here post-All-Star break where he both kept an imminent and gave them a chance to win when that starting group got him off to a bad start. He, he came in, saved them, and what he's been able to do, again, post-All-Star break, he's been their most consistent player. He's averaging 14 points per game. Remember, like, coming in, like, you expect him to assist, maybe five assists, and a couple of baskets if there's something open. Now he's changed the dynamic where you want him taking shots, and I think he's done a tremendous job probably throughout his career just adapting and making do with what he can, and right now, over the last couple of years, it's been the addition of being able to knock down a three-pointer when left open, but more specifically, that kind of fadeaway eight-foot, ten-foot jumper where he goes up and kind of fades away away from the defense where guys really struggle and don't have success blocking him. But, yeah, I think TJ should absolutely be in consideration for sixth man of the year. I think his, his con, uh, consideration – Probably should have picked up the last couple of months. I can understand why he's not in the conversation uh, the first few months. And also, the biggest thing is how many people are keeping tabs right on six mans across the league. And so, generally, people are probably going to points and looking for that 20-point score off the bench, like a Russell Westbrook or someone who's eye-popping, and that's where they lean on. Scott, in the playoffs itself, Scott Agnes is our guest, Fieldhouse Files, joining us on the show here. You know, it's hard to remember this, but if we were to go back and look at the Pacers at the beginning of the year, I think the expectation of the hope was, hey, get it in the playoffs, play a play a series, 
and play in some meaningful games and learn from that. Like I look back to when, and I'm going back a million years ago, but you know, when Oladipo first kind of broke through, if you recall, and they mm-hmm. went like seven games against Cleveland. And that was a real learning block for them, right? And then obviously things kind of went south from there. But it feels like with this group at the beginning of the year, that would have been sufficient of like that's what this group needs. But now that we know they can compete, does the narrative change? I know they want to win a playoff series, don't get me wrong, but what I'm getting at is if the dust settles and they lose in round one in six or seven games, can we chalk that as a long-term victory? I think so, Jake, just because they've been out of the postseason since 2020. They've had two coaches since they've been in the postseason. So you're right. The players all talked about how getting to the postseason and experiencing some of that was the goal. And I think it became the demand once you get a guy like Pascal Siakam. If it would have been a failure if they are in a top six seed and Siakam uh, was acquired at the trade deadline, I think. I think it's critical for the development of this team, for the experience of this team, to get a taste of it. But you do look and how jam-packed the standings are. We're not so sure they'll sit at six. They have a chance here, win a couple, their last couple of games, could move up a spot or two. Maybe you have the four or five seed with uh, facing Orlando or Cleveland potentially. And then on top of that, every team right there outside of Boston has its flaws. Milwaukee not playing well at all right now at the two seed. I don't trust them in the playoffs, though you do expect, um, know that Dame and Giannis have that experience. The Knicks will be without Julius Randle. OG's been battling the uh, health concern the last couple of months. What's his availability? Orlando, much like the Pacers, don't have that playoff experience, so you could see it go either way. And the Cavs, I don't think you can trust them. The the rumor mill seemingly has Donovan Mitchell going elsewhere at the end of the season. What do they look like? Um, So I think I don't think it would be a failure by any means for them to – get to the postseason and lose in round one, but because of the way it's set up and the way in which they play competitively in games that matter, good teams, I think you should be encouraged by their prospects of reaching round two. Scott Agnes, Pacers beat writer for Fieldhouse Files, joins us. Scott, the rotation has continued to amaze me at times because you figure <laughs> that they're they're going to tighten things and it's going to be a clear eight man set and these are the eight guys or eight or nine guys and that's what we're rolling with by the time we get to the end of the regular season two games from now do you envision that there is a clear eight nine set in stone pieces of this is it and the other couple guys on the bench sorry about you or do you imagine it is this hybrid look where based on matchup is who is added into the bench rotation yeah i think it's pretty well that for the most part with a nine man with McDermott being kind of a fringe inside out, depending on what they need, if they need shooting, uh, et cetera. But I could also see you go into the playoffs, you face Cleveland uh, with a couple bigs there up top, then maybe uh, you stretch it out and maybe even the 10th man instead of McDermott, it becomes a Isaiah Jackson, for example. But I think we've seen how even pre McDermott injury, uh, it seems like it's a nine man rotation with McDermott occasionally getting some minutes and and that would be huge if he could come in and knock down at least a couple of threes in a 10 minute stint come the postseason anything more than nine or ten you are really pushing it um you'd really like to stay at nine i think and give guys more minutes um especially as you need guys like neesmith to be productive on both ends nimhart you'd like to see him a little bit more productive on the offensive end scott i think i might have asked you this before scott agnes our guest but i want to revisit it i think it's worth revisiting you know, each month, especially as we head towards Mm -hmm. the end of the year. I I think Jalen Smith has continued to, when his number has called, play well. Might have struggled a little bit like midseason, but now that he's getting consistent minutes, you know, he's showing obviously why he's in the rotation. Has he priced himself out of being able to be retained by Indiana? Well, first of all, he'll have to decide on his player. Well, he he has a player option, right? He is going to say whether or not he wants to come back, right? Yeah, so first of all, there is that option. It's at $5.4 million. It, It'd be, you know, is there, a, is there teams out there looking to pay him seven, eight, nine? And then it also, of course, Jake, becomes what does he want to do? Because he knows his role right now. He knows Rick Carlisle's belief in him. He knows what kind of minutes that he's going to be getting on a night-in-and-night basis from this situation. That's a reason he kind of bought into it, even having to take a pay cut. He had a couple better offers out there, I was told, 
uh, in free agency back in 2022. But remember, he blew up here after being acquired and was shooting crazy from three-point land, like 50%. Um, I don't think he has, but I think he'll have to make a decision of is he good where he's at right now, but also understanding, hey, look, too, uh, sooner or later the Pacers will have to make another decision what they do at starting center with Miles. He'll have just one more year under contract. Um, and, and Isaiah Jackson, the same way, he's on the final year of his rookie deal next year. So it could be a chance where Jalen succeeds Miles after that. Maybe they re-sign Miles. Um, but I think he's content and he's comfortable within his skin and, and his role, I would say, more than ever this season. And that's why he's really been able to thrive. No secret on this show. I love Isaiah Jackson. Yeah. Because he just brings something that nobody else on that roster seems to bring. Um and, and he's ready every time his number seemingly is called. Question is, is he that guy if, like, at some point his role is going to have to be elevated, right, long-term? Can he put up that kind of production if he's getting significant long-term minutes, or is it just because we're seeing him in short bursts? I think I think he could be a really good backup, dependable center in this league. I haven't seen enough to believe that, hey, he can be – a 32 minute guy every single night um, just because we really haven't seen that from him. The biggest area I think he's improved much like the younger guys. Once they mature is he couldn't come in for a minute in previous years and not foul. He hasn't picked up those foul, the foul trouble. And also he continues to rebound at a, a better clip. Like again, the Toronto Raptors under man sitting guys, their season's over. They want to lose to lock in uh, a top six draft pick here. But at the same time, Isaiah coming in with something to play for grabs seven rebounds in 18 minutes. Like those are the little encouraging things. And then on top of that, as you mentioned, Jake, the dynamic, the, his ability to run and finish lots. Like this team never was good at dunking until the last couple of years. And now they're one of the uh, highest uh, has the highest rate at dunking. Um, as we saw last night with Isaiah and Obi Toppin um, in particular too. So to answer your question, I think I'm not sure he's a starter caliber player, but I definitely think he's a backup. And let's say uh, Jalen moves on next year, just hypothetically, I would have uh, no short in confidence that Isaiah would step up and fill that role nicely. Scott, where do you see the biggest matchup problems on either side, both for Cleveland and Indiana, when you look at what is effectively a potential playoff preview? Because if I'm not mistaken there, if Cleveland does win, there's still an avenue where it could be Three six Pacers Cavs. What, what what do you see from this early potential preview matchup between these two Central Division foes? Yeah, well, first of all, you, the Cavs have a player who's been there, done that, and Donovan Mitchell. So that's always a little bit scary and and something that concerns you. And on top of that, the Pacers, while they have Neesmith and Nimhard, I still don't think they have that elite elite defender that you are just very comfortable throwing him on anyone knowing he can be that stopper. Uh, Pascal Siakam has sometimes has taken on uh, the greater workload defensively as well in matchups. And he prevents a little bit different problems just because of his length. So uh, Mitchell is a little bit concerning. Um, the bigs inside with Jaron Allen, Evan Mobley, that's a different look um, than, and so it's two con- competing styles, right? Pacers are trying to run, play fast, and shoot a lot and knock down threes. The Cavaliers, meanwhile, more of an inside style. Um, and from the Cavaliers' standpoint, can they keep up with that pace? Uh, what what does Sia- who guards Siakam for them uh, would be something of concern, I think, uh, when it comes to that. Um, and then also the Pacers have played the Cavs really well. Now they haven't seen them lately, um, but I remember early in the season they played them like twice in the first. Uh, six games Pacers won both of those meetings they scored in high clips Miles Turner had success uh, as they kind of left him open and knocked down shots in the way in which the Cavaliers chose to guard him Uh, so I like that much matchup it doesn't scare me um, as much as necessarily maybe another one does like the Knicks even though they don't have Brunson and the Magic are much like Toronto and those new modern style uh, construction of teams just with length and athleticism at every position. Scott, how would you assess, if any, I guess, the evolution or the improvement since acquisition of Pascal Siakam defensively? Uh, honestly, my first thought is to be determined. I still need to see more, I think, from that side of it. I think offensively, he's gotten more comfortable. He's asserted himself more, and I'd still like to see even more of that, in fact. Like, 
when the team's falling behind in 10 points early on, I'd like to see him take over and say, nope, we're not doing this. I got this. Defensively, I, I know we're about 39 games into him um, being with this roster and being able to settle in. I think he's been fine. I don't think it's been elite by any means, um, but I'm not sure they were necessarily expecting that as well. You know, the offensively in terms of, you know, now it's been, you know, it's been long enough with Siakam, Scott, do you feel like that offense is starting to kind of flow again? Because it did, I, I think when he was first acquired, just naturally speaking, the offense was slowing down because you had parts that were just not used to moving along with one another, right? And now all of a sudden, there is more familiarity. What percentage of pace offensively do you think they are versus where they ultimately need and will be? Yeah, I would say with this current iteration, they're probably about 90% of what they're trying to do um, and get accomplished. The challenge for the, this group in its totality has just been the different iterations of this team, right? Early on, you were talking about sprinting up the floor because you had Bruce Brown and Obi Toppin. Toppin was in the starting lineup. Um, then you move on from Bruce Brown. Then you move on from Buddy Heald. Tyrese loses that safety net, that three-point threat in Buddy Heald, um, and their three-point – uh, attempts are down, three-point percentage. What they're getting from the three-point line in general is down, and that is something of note and concern, I think, uh, entering the postseason. They continue to excel in the paint. Um, Pascal's taking more shots. He now leads the team in field goal attempts uh, at about 16 per game post-All-Star break. I think that's good, but then you lose Benedict Madrin. So it's a whole different iteration, and they're going to miss him in the playoff for his, you know, his toughness, how hard he plays. And he was the best player on this roster at getting to the free throw line. Although I think Siakam can help alleviate that a little bit. He's not getting the free throws he was getting in Toronto. Pacers are one of the uh, lowest free throw shooting teams in the uh, NBA. Siakam can help in that department. And I think have then having a full off season coming off a postseason run, um, assuming he resigns, which is the plan for both sides. Then you hope that can take off and, and ideally consolidate the roster even more and add ideally a three and D guy. Like we continue to be talking about as well. Scott, if Robin, the genie gave you Boston or the field in the East, which do you take Boston? And then it's not even close. Okay. If Robin, the genie gave you Boston or the field in the West, who do you take? I think right now I just take the field because I still see Denver right there looming Jokic best player in the league and there is a little hesitation come the big game um can the Celtics close it off can they finish it off Celt or the Nuggets been there done that um but out of the east I would have zero questions about Boston coming out I think I would be I think only injuries will slow Boston down speaking of Nuggets uh, let me throw one at <laughs> you and then you tell me how crazy I am okay if Boston were to win it this year Brad Stevens gets the itch to begin coaching again. Your thoughts? Too soon. I think it's too soon. I think it would be once his kids are out of the house. Well, that's true. That's two years away, it. right? Something like that. Yep. Yeah, I think he has a daughter that's maybe a freshman or sophomore, it seems like. Um, I don't think it'd even be in consideration from there. Then it would just decide. It'd be one of those, hey, I, I wanted to be an exec. I proved what I could do. It helped me at home and my my lifestyle there. Um, and now do I have an itch to do something else? My understanding is he loves it. He's content exactly where he is. Well, but I would have okay. agreed with that, Scott, for a long time. Okay. I, and I've laughed at it, right? I've laughed at the whole, like, I'm like, he's co he's in the NBA as an official, an executive. And I don't think that he is – I don't think he has an eye on leaving, but I think he's starting to feel the itch just a little bit. And that would okay. – that, yeah. that would – you know how when you get poison ivy, you scratch it and then it itches even more? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like maybe like the hive is there and the itch hasn't started, but winning a championship, suddenly it's like you scratch it the first time. I would not be surprised, Jake. I just think it'd need to be three to five years down the road. I would be stunned if it was in the next couple of I'll years. I'll agree, sure. but I, I, I'll agree with you, but I'll say, and, I, and listen, I laughed forever at fans that would say this stuff, okay? But – I'm starting to think a little bit, but I'll, I'll say two to three. I'll, I'll agree with you, but I'll say two to three. But we shall see. This is this I'll is why we over. have Sports Talk Radio. I've got the over on that, Jake. Okay.
He is Scott Agnes of Fieldhouse Files, covering the Pacers all season long and especially down the stretch run here. Scott, I know you mentioned the six man of the year conversation piece, but anything else you've got in the works with two games to go? Yeah, uh, one piece I'm writing about is is uh, what's going on a little, what has gone on up in Westfield. It's a, a little side story, but I think it's kind of cool that Trey Buchanan, the GM, Chad Buchanan's son was up there, Anthony Richardson's brother's up there. We saw uh, Colts general manager Chris Ballard's son was the quarterback up there. So I went up to a game this season to watch Trey Buchanan and, and follow his game, and I, that'll be a fun story I'm working on, on top of uh, just looking ahead to the postseason here and, and what's to come. And then coming up also, a little side thing is on Sunday, uh, Miles Turner will have a special outfit designed by an Indiana University student. Ty- Tyrese Halliburton did that last year. Miles Turner got involved this year, so I'll have a story about that as well for the season finale. So that wasn't the pajamas that Tyrese Halliburton was wearing last night? <laughs> it was not, no. I think he was wearing – he looked like – you know how sometimes you go to Walmart and you see somebody walking around in SpongeBob SquarePants pajamas and, and like and shoes like Eddie's wearing, and you're like, what are we doing here? What you are those shoes they called, didn't Eddie? You go out, but they had to go get that one more thing exactly. to complete the order. They throw on the Crocs the cleaning and supplies. a pair of fleece plant, pants. Hey, dudes. Those are hey, dudes? Okay, yes. those aren't bad. Those aren't bad. I, I thought you had on Crocs. Don't you wear Crocs every once in a while? Very, very rare. <laughs> Do you wear Crocs with socks? No. Scott, I consider socks with sandals a violation unless you're in Europe. Your thoughts? I would agree, although you do see a lot of that in the or in basketball in general, right? You just finished playing the game. You well, not not necessarily slides. Around. I'm talking about like if you're wearing Birkenstocks with socks, if you're oh, yeah, and you're yeah, not absolutely. German, then like no, not yeah, happening. Yeah, that's a huge red flag. Totally agree, uh, Scott. We appreciate the time as always. Likewise, thanks, All guys. Right, Scott Agnes joining us on the show. Who's wearing flip flops with socks? Like I've done the slides with socks. Oh, like, I've you, seen it. Really. Yes. Well, what's the difference between slides and flip flops? Well, you've Fli- made the point. That's why I'm saying no, no, no. slides. It, it, it the, doesn't have the. No, I know what slides are. I, I consider band. slides. Flip flops would have the, the toe, the toe, the toe okay. thing. Yeah. I consider all of it. slides is a term that only came about like three or four years ago. I think they've and got the bikini for the shoe. At least a decade. I'll, I'll fight. I'll fight you on that. that. That's since my high school days. That's slides common term. When did when did um, Lonzo Ball like when did those come out? That that nobody... like big baller brand? You mean? Yeah. Uh, we're going on seven years okay. now. I, that was the first time I really heard the term slides. So, like in, I had a pair. In, actually, one of my favorite things, to be honest with you, were the Adidas. They would be slides. The the ones that Ice Cube wears in Boys in the Hood. Like everyone had those. Sure. But but back in that term, they were just called flip flops. To be sure. honest, to my knowledge, sandals every now and again. Sandals, yeah, that's another one. But like if you're wearing like the Birkenstocks, which I think are technically slides right because they don't have the little toe jam you're talking about the ones with like the the multiple straps like my wife owns a pair of birkenstocks and i would like you got the i guess they do have two yeah straps right yes yeah if you're wearing those with socks yeah, though yeah, yeah, yeah. one or the other right no. one or the other i, I don't get it Unless i've never a... gotten into the birkenstocks but people tell me they're the most comfortable things ever but i don't want to see I, here's the thing i don't want to see people's toes and i don't want them to see mine and i know that i've now we're in a whole dark area yeah, that it's hard for me to get out, out of quickly but if you, let me just tell you right now if you're on an airplane Oh, no. I had a streak at one point, and this is a, one of the great mistakes of my life and one of the great regrets of my life. I had a streak where I had, and I counted, 26 consecutive flights. Some jackass in my row took their shoes off. Like, what are we doing? No idea. Okay? It, it's the, I don't understand it. And then and I've seen multiple times, multiple times, I've seen people going to the bathroom barefoot on a plane, right? These people are a walking Petri dish and should be immediately exiled. I would agree. That's how Australia started. They just sent Britain just sent people there that were doing this on airplanes, right? So, so my thing is this: even with that, I don't want to see your socks, like dirty socks, and I don't want to see your toes, and I don't. I'm expecting that people don't want to see either of mine either. I, I, I just, it disgusts me. Well, it, it's also this is not the geographic area where it should be commonplace. If you yeah. live in Miami or something, like okay, I get I, that's, it. That's that's hard to argue. Like if yeah. you're near a beach. Okay, probably all bets are off. But here, I'm right there with you. Well, if you're on a plane, I'm telling you right now, I'd rather the guy next to me just fire up a lung dart than be barefoot. <laughs> hey, it's JMV for the best in realty, Mark Deedle, Mark Deedle.
I could sit here and do the whole thing. You know that, right? Grab my clip with the Mac-10 on the side of my hip. Bells outside, one of my weapon. Just as I thought, the fools kept stepping. Jumped in the foe, hit the juice on my line. I got front, back, and side to side. Um, I probably should stop at some point, number one, because nobody wants to hear that. And number two, uh, I'll forget it's the edited version, right? But Eddie Garrison queuing up the hits. I like that. Boys in the Hood. You mentioned Boys in the Hood. It just sparked my mind. Did you guys see the movie Boys in the Hood? I have. I have. It's a good movie. I it, it to this day it's still I I just get so mad at Ricky for stopping and scratching the lottery tickets. Like get out of the alley before you scratch the lottery tickets, right? Yep. Eating the donuts. <laughs> come on. And then he had to use the bathroom. I mean, come on, man. Just wait till you're home. Wait He's till no Spicoli, home. isn't he? <laughs> What's that? He was no Spicoli. Uh, Sp- Spicoli would have at least Spicoli when the weapons got out was up the ramp, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> came out for a couple of towels, and that was that. Um, good afternoon to you. My name is Jake Quarry, Jimmy Cook, and Eddie Garrison here as well. We're going to talk Masters coming up in about 25 minutes. That gets underway tomorrow is day number one, correct? Jimmy, have you been to the Masters? I've not. It's a bucket list item. I didn't know if that's where you there. bought your Donald Duck shirt. No, bought this at the uh, Arnold Palmer. I still Palmer. can't see the – hold right. on, i got to put my glasses on so I can see what it is on the shirt. Uh, I bought it when we went to play one of the courses at Walt Disney World. Way to fill time, Jimmy. Way to fill time while he gets his glasses. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for having my back there. I can't find my glasses. This is a problem, right? I thought you were in permanent function of glasses era, Jake. I thought we were locked into that. I know. Well, I got two new pair. You know, I had that. So we had that. um, I had that health savings account or flex. There's a flex spending account and a health savings account. And one of them expires at the end of the year and the other rolls over. And I had the one that expires at the end of the year. And so... I realized it, and I had money in it, and they said, well, you lose your money if – so I said, okay. And then, I, I, as I mentioned before, last year I went on their their little website of their store where you can buy stuff with the money that you have, and there really wasn't anything to my liking on there, right? I mean, I'm you know pretty much full of Metamucil. So I went over to my parents' house, and I don't even know if this is illegal, but I said, uh, do you guys need anything off this? And so my dad – Gets on you said my, this. You've told me this yeah, before. My my dad ordered <laughs> my dad ordered one hundred and seventy nine dollars worth of band aids. Okay, <laughs> now I don't know what sort of hatchet house he's running over there, <laughs> but he said, "Well, you know, I'm on the blood thinners." And I said, "Well, I am too, Dad." But I mean, you know, and so then, literally a month later, my mom calls and says, uh, "Hi, Jake. It's mom. Do you need band aids? Because we have um, they just dropped <laughs> off an entire pallet of them. You know, if your dad runs into." into any more people looking for their cat. <laughs> if they the could cat have scratches, scratches them, on them. That is true. From if like the, these trees and bushes and such. That's an so excellent point. You never know. The cat might scratch my dad while he's helping neighbors look for lost cats. And then they'll get to the baseball cards. So this year, I decided that instead of having my you know parents buy $200 worth of Preparation H, I went and bought eyeglasses. And they came yesterday. And and they now look they're little, gone. They look a little different, and now I can't find them. Darn it! Those lasted an entire day. Wasn't that fun? Anyway, Donald Duck Polo purchased it at Walt Disney World. Okay, one of and, their and I still can't see though from here. All right, I'll move. Yeah, I, I what I see something on the top. Okay, so Donald is in his backswing. There we go. He he's he's, he's in upset. his backswing. He's holding the pin in his hand. He's upset. That's because the pin. I thought it was a he, club. Yeah, no, it's. A, Again, that's the detail without the glasses that you are foregoing there. But he's holding the pin because he's upset that he missed a putt. Okay, fair enough. So you have or have not been to Augusta National? I have not. It's on the bucket list, but I've not been there. You've not either. I have not, but I do understand and I respect the fact. And I know several people that have. You know, the grounds are immaculate. I mean, that's the thing about it that is just, you know, I haven't, I haven't been there. But I'm just going by what people tell me, that that – Seeing just overall Augusta National in person is 90% of, aside from seeing the greatest golfers in the world. Amen Corner, the Azaleas. I mean, that's yeah, the, I mean just you want to be a part of well, it. Well, and it's, the fact that every blade of grass is perfectly manicured, right? I mean, I, I get it. Do you remember, and I, this is bigger, I think, for my generation and my parents, but do you remember when CBS was first introducing the transition over to HD? And we would always do the game where you go uh, yeah, back to standard yes, depth yeah, yeah, yeah. and then flip over to Augusta, and it's like, oh, the 
just the wrinkles of sunlight off the water. Like the attention to detail from that technological advancement. If you would go, this is probably like 04, 05. You go on standard definition and you flip over to the high definition feed and it was just immaculate. Like it was exactly what you're describing, but like you were there. Now the, I will say when high def first came out, I remember I worked at channel six and they're like, we're going to bring in the Super Bowl on a high def television. And I'm like, okay. And I, I'll be honest, I, I couldn't really see it. I was like, okay. I mean, it looks a little clear. They're like, look at look at how clear you can see the guy in the fifth that's row. That's because you lost like, your glasses. You that's right. Really I'm like, I don't care about the guy in the fifth in. row. I want to see what's happening in the game, right? But now, of course, uh, you know, we know no different. But the the one fun thing about the Masters to me is to just I I pick Masters winners oftentimes. The same, I, I do the same for the Kentucky Derby, and I love the Kentucky Derby, and I really do think that people from Indianapolis. Indiana have more of an understand. Like if you live in Louisville, I can only imagine if you live in Louisville or you live in, in the state of Kentucky, what the Kentucky Derby means to you, because it's the oldest tradition in, in sports in the United States, right? Or, or up there, one of them. And that's my, there's a small section of Indiana too, right? Like that's where my crossover is. Like I, I love the Kentucky Derby because my dad exposed me to it. He raised horses there. He had a box at Churchill Downs. Like it was it's very special to me, but you're right. In that same way, for Kentucky, it is the state identifier in the same way the 500 is here. And I agree. But in addition to that, you you touched on something earlier, Jimmy, that I think is very true. The Derby, because it's the first Saturday in May, and especially now where the month of May, like we're, we're so like excited in Indianapolis, like it's the month of May, and then you actually realistically wait a couple of weeks before anything really gets going. But – for so long, you know, the Derby was on the opening weekend of practice of the 500. But I think that even though somebody living in Spokane, Washington, or somebody living in Plymouth, Massachusetts, or El Paso, Texas, can watch and appreciate and love the Kentucky Derby, when they are doing all of the pre-race festivities, when they are bringing the horses to post, and then when they obviously, you know, the – getting everybody together and the clothing and then the playing of my old Kentucky home. I can only imagine what that's like for people of Kentucky or people in Louisville. But if you live in Indianapolis, I think it is the one place where you have a feeling of reciprocity or a mutual admiration and respect for the event and what it means to people there, because we know what it means during taps and back home again in yeah. Indiana. That's your parallel, and right? And everything that comes in for the pre-race of the Indianapolis 500. Like, it is – I can see it. When I watch people at Churchill Downs and I see what it means to them for that moment and to have their city and their community on display for everybody with a tradition that was passed on from generation to generation, we can relate to that here. And – I mean, it is undoubtedly special, right? When it comes to the Masters, I get that for a lot. It is a lot of the aesthetics and tradition of it: the green jacket, the dinner, the as you mentioned, the azaleas, the 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 grounds crew. All of that is what makes it special. Now, as I mentioned, there is also another side of it that's a little bit, to me, a turnoff. But that's not for this place or this show. I mean, I get that. But when it comes to the Kentucky Derby and watching and picking who's going to win, I know nothing about – I mean, I, know, I shouldn't say that. I know a decent amount about horse racing. But I love looking at the names of the horses and just going, okay, I like – and you look at the odds, right? I mean, if one of them is a three-to-one, I mean, you know, you know. But I, and I always enjoy finding, like, one dark horse, one – favorite but not the favorite and then you know and picking three of them for win play show and i do the same thing with the masters i have nothing i i don't know when will comes on we'll ask him like who's playing well or who's the grounds this year really favor whose game or who has redone their grip in the last year that might change things whatever those things all factor into picking the masters winner i just look at the list and then i go okay that guy's name looks good and, I, and that's who i pick which is the same thing you could do with the derby Correct. That, Literally, just oh, what, I like what that. I just name. Said. Yeah, that's, I know, but but yeah. like you, that that's funny. I don't, I don't think of it because my mom would pick horses that way, right? Like if there was a name that had like a cat involved with it, 
like, yeah, yeah. like, 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 well, like, I mean, like Sunday Cat, or whatever. Like, she, she would love. Isn't that people? How people that win the NCAA tournament pools yes, always do it? Exactly. But it, it's funny to think of the same thing, names, but instead of horses' names, it's people's names. And yes, you could do the same thing with the Masters. I don't know. So your laugh. pick is who? My pick right now. Mm-hmm, yep. I mean. It'd be hard not to pick against Scotty Scheffler going in. He is admittedly the betting fam- you favorite. You it'd be hard to pick against him. Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, I like Justin Thomas this week as a potential outright winner. Um, Bryson DeChambeau is always a popular pick. And look, I am, not to fully get us down the path that I know you hate to go down because you have to do it every uh, time of year around this time in the mornings, but while I'm not as big of a super fan of Kevin... I would love to see Tiger back in the action on Sunday. As Kevin, not of Kevin. You're a super fan of Kevin. I know that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. We, so we are back in class, Professor. That's right. Okay, good. We'll make sure. Well, I just want to make sure people are aware. Like, what do you have against Kevin Bowen? Uh, okay. Victor Hovland. Am I saying that right? You are. It's my guy. All right. He is. Now, let me throw a couple other names Plus 3,500 on mm-hmm. certain sports books. Ludwig Aberg. His, I loved his ninth symphony. Give me that one more time. Am I saying it right? I don't know. Ludwig Aberg. Yes, okay. I thought I thought you ran over the Vig. Okay. Go no. ahead. You're good. Yeah. I'm a fan of Ludwig. The way that he he that guy is the he, <laughs> let me tell you You're something. You're looking for the von Beethoven half he, of that. That's he, where we're going. Ludwig Aberg, that guy goes out. It's like a <laughs> symphony watching that guy play, right? That's what I've heard. He is a maestro. <laughs> he can go out there and he is going to compose seventy two holes of perfection. Right? And then What's going to be fun is next year when he comes back and wins it again, then it's going to be Ludwig, A- uh, Ludwig Aberg, right? But it's going to be number two, right? Yes. It's going to be a couple of different symphonies put Correct. together. Correct. Sure. Symphony number I two. I understand what we're doing. Nice. Uh, how about Jason Day? I like Jason Day. I don't have any problem with that. Brooks Kepka could be another one you go with. John Rahm. Minwoo Lee. I will not lie to you. I don't know anything about Min Woo Lee. Don't sleep on it. <laughs> don't sleep on him. No. Don't sleep on Min Woo Lee. Right? <laughs> I'm being totally serious. Being totally serious. Love the short game. Precise Min Woo Lee. Maybe it's Rory's time. He's got better Rory odds. I mean, Min Woo Lee's odds are not terrible. He's got better odds than Sergio Garcia. Better than Patrick Reed. Isn't Patrick Reed the one that everybody hates? Yes. Correct. Like his family didn't talk to him and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Isn't that him? Yeah. Ricky, is Patrick Reed the, is he the Aaron Rodgers of the PGA? I don't think he's quite into like, like alienates everybody. Type thing? Yeah, sure. From that end. The, That's the, what I mean. Aaron Rodgers definition has changed over the last well, two yeah, years I due mean, to, yeah. uh, you're not you know. kidding, right? A lot of people I think will try to get behind Rory, finally win a green jacket. That happens year over year. I'm interested to see Will Haskett's thoughts on that. Okay. This is maybe a breakthrough year but for here, Rory. Here's my dark horse. Here's my dark horse. Do you mm-hmm. want me to wait until Will Haskett's on? I, I, man. I'm telling you right now. It would be a terrific tease, Jake. I'm going to make money for everybody with my. Now, Mike Weir, I'm always a fan of because Michael Weir's the lead singer of the elect, and they are the best local band in Indianapolis, and there's nothing like a summer night at the Rathskello listening to the elect and Mike Weir up on stage. He is a dark horse in the Masters. Not the same one, but but similar. So I got to go with him, too. I'm throwing a lot of names out, I realize. But but all of this is essentially what I'm throwing at you right now is just trying to cloud you. I'm throwing you all these names so that you're rushing to the betting window and you're making sure, even though obviously two people can bet on the same guy, but I'm going to be the only one to bet on this guy. And I'm going to make... I think Min Woo Lee would have fit that bill already for you. No, 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 no. No, Min Woo Lee is, uh, trust me, he's like... Nicholas or Palmer in comparison. <laughs> I have the guy. I have the guy. Years ago, I've told this story 20 times, but I'll tell it again. I'm driving on Kessler. I see a festival going on, Christ the King Festival. I park. I go in. I think this looks fun. I'm like 25 years old. I got a free Wednesday evening. I go in. They have horse racing. You can wager on horse racing. I don't know how this is legal, but it was. And so I said, how does this work? And they said, well, we just have tapes of old Horse races. I've told the story like 50 times. Every t- every year during the Derby, I tell the story. I'll tell it again in two weeks. And I say, well, how does this work? And they go, we just have old horse races, and you just pick whichever horse you think is going to win, and then if it wins, you you get the pot or you split it with the other people that have wagered on said horse. I go, okay, fine. 
and they hand me this list, and like starting in the third post, it says Secretariat. <laughs> and I go, how old are these horse races? And they said, oh, they're like 25 years old. They're old, old tapes. This was like 1997. <laughs> I go, okay, I'm going to put like, I'll put my dollar on Secretariat, right? Well, needless to say, right? <laughs> I was the only one that did. Could okay. you only put a dollar? Because I would have been going chips it, all in if you saw Secretary up was, on the board. You could only put one dollar in. All but right, there okay. were like, you know, 50 people. So I, I, I clean out for like 50 bucks, right? Sure. So I clean out the, the Christ the King. Uh, Joe Coppa will tell you. I mean, they, they were scrounging for like a year there. They were struggling because I cleaned them out I, <laughs> on this action. I have that. I'm telling you. I'm going to do the same thing with the Masters this year. I'm going to clean You've up. You've already seen gonna, the tape. Yes, I'm, no, but tape. I'm going to be the only one to wager on this person. And I have a fabulous reason why. A fabulous reason why. I'm wagering on this person. And then when they win, I, I, I'll buy lunch for all of us when this guy wins. Well, that's kind of you. Okay. Well, Will Haskett's going to join us. Top of the hour, and I'll tell you who it is. Heat and cool places where ductwork won't fit.
reading up on it right now. <laughs> we're we're starting. Shannon and I are planning our annual vacation that we'll be taking. You know, probably towards the latter half of the year. And I didn't, re- you know, the flights kind of went up in the last week. But I'm not even worried about it now because this is going to pay for the whole thing. I mean, the 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 guy that I picked here. Um, Here's an article right now coming in on a hot streak. An impressive run over the last year. Just shot, how about this, just shot a 64 in a tournament. I mean, this is easy money. I Literally. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like that fella in Copperhead Road. I'm just printing out my own. So what I'm trying to figure moonshine. out. Moonshine. <laughs> What I'm trying to figure out right now is if it's a funny name and that's what caught your eye or what, what drew no, you? No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to undermine the process. I'm the, I'm the Marty Blake of sports prognostication. Mm, okay. I, I have a natural eye for these things. Yep. I, do you know how many things I've said? You know what? I think this might be a thing. And then and everybody laughs at me and then it comes true. Do you know how often that happens to me? That Listen, when my day comes – and I meet my maker, and it's 50-50 which way the elevator's going. But when I'm walking around up there in the clouds, you know the first person to come up and give me a fist bump? Historically. All time. And I assume that this person, you know, made it past the pearly gates. You know who's going to come up and give me the fist bump of, like, I got you, bro. Who's that? I, I know what life was like for you. Lay it on me. Nostradamus. It's my homie. <laughs> he, he literally going to come up and be like, you know what? I get it, bro. Like I know it was not always easy when you, when you said things were going to happen and people laughed at you and said like, you're out of your mind. And then it ended up happening. And it was like, you know what? Maybe you did know what you're talking about. Like three years from now, people are going to look back on our conversation with Scott Agnes. And they're going to go, you know what? Nostradamus. I'm telling you about and, and Mr. Stevens. That's correct. And the same is going to hold true. I'm just telling you right now, the same is going to hold true with, my prediction on who's going to win the Masters. Now, you know who actually does have that kind of a skill. How about Aaron? Um, Aaron, whose last name I'm going to try to pronounce, and I I, I want to do this correctly. Uh, Kiamani Vong. Aaron Kiamani Vong won our online NCAA tournament pool. First out of 77, he had Connecticut winning it. So, Aaron, I am also going to hook you up with a Lou Malnati's golf, uh, or excuse me, gift card and a UConn hat since you had predicted UConn would win it. I am going to send that to Aaron for winning our online pool. So, congratulations to him on um, out of 77 entrants for the Quarry and Company NCAA tournament pool. He is the winner. And he won, I, I, he must have done the same bracket because it won the morning shows as well. We'll see if those guys hook him up, right? But I can afford to do these hookups because of the money that I'm going to get back for the Masters. Can I make a guess before you tell Will? You can tell me. You can guess the first letter of the last name of the golfer. J. No. All right. No. All right. That would have been fun. Uh, hey, Jake, you need to get a shirt made. Nostradamus is my homie. It's true. It's my spirit animal, right? <laughs> he Every once in a while, I, I can actually hear him saying to me, like, Oh, ye, Mr. Querian, you are correct. Yes. I don't even know how we would speak, but yes. Well, that was a cross between. I think that was your Irish accent, but it learned more ah, vocabulary. Ta, 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 ta. Ah, that's correct, yeah. I think I figured out who it is. What's the first letter of the last name? C. No, no, oh, no. Ooh. C is for average. This guy's anything but. Going to win the Masters. Now, last year, I think when we did this with Will Haskett, I threw it out, and he's like, yeah, that guy actually withdrew this morning. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, then... But I'm telling you, this guy's coming in on a hot streak. Shot a 60 in a tournament recently. He did. He he. This guy shot a 60 in a tournament as a teenager. I'm telling you, this is the guy. And and, and when I say this name, everyone's gonna laugh at me. And it literally is gonna be like in 1994 if you'd have told people like, you know, this Eldrick Woods is good. And people are like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and boom. I'm telling you. This guy right now, this is this is what this guy sounds like. If we were to get this guy on the show, you know what he sounds like right now? Like this. He sounds like this. You know why? Why? Because he's a baby tiger. 
But I'm telling Will you. Will you look up baby tiger sounds I'm, for me and I'm play it side by right side now. with whatever that was? Play it. It sounds like this. Meh. <laughs> Meh. Like they haven't learned to roar yet. This guy's about to roar, and people are going to say, Tiger part duh. Sounds more like Boo when he's upset that you're tr- not you're not asleep yet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to sleep in this morning. Boo had other plans. Will Haskett is next. If you're talking about it. It's a perfect day, Augusta. Such a beautiful sound. I'm telling you right now. Hello, friends. Okay, this right here is, these are dulcet tones, right? These are soothing sounds. That's what my guy sounds like entering Augusta. Just the aura around him? This time, a week from now, my guy's (laughs) going to sound like Metallica and Gigi Allen. Just an absolute, like... Not even a, I mean, you you think brush fire. My guy is about to take off, and when my guy wins the Masters, people are going to say, and you you mark my words, and and what do they say about, what does Mike Damone, Ratner say to Mike Damone, Eddie? You know, when 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 they say that that Damone's a loudmouth, and they say that a lot, right? With me, (laughs) people say that that, that I'm Nostradamus, and they say that a lot. They're going to be saying it again when this guy wins the Masters, and they're going to go, that query guy. I'll tell you what, he is You just don't know him like I do. (laughs) That's right. Will Haskett joins us on the program to talk about the Masters. He is, of course, Indianapolis' foremost expert when it comes to the PGA. Joins us now. Uh, Will, do you have your pick on who's going to win the Masters? You know, it's weird. I don't because it's been such a, a... a strange lead up to it with talent kind of splintered in the world of golf and Scotty Scheffler being so dominant in the space that it's really hard. I think to just say, Oh yeah, here are my three or four guys or here's my one guy, because you have to sort of asterisk every pick and say, well, if Scotty Scheffler doesn't win, then I guess this is my guy because it's we've, we've reached that rarefied time in a golfer's, you know, I guess apex where it's uh, he versus the field. We don't get him versus the field very often, and we're pretty close to it right now with the way Scotty Scheffler's playing golf. Well, so that was going to lead. Okay, before we get to that, and I'm going to ask Will, and I apologize for asking. I do have a pick, by the way. So you can wait till the end if you want an additional well, pick. Well, now listen, if it's my guy, if it's my guy, then you've got to have a second pick because I'm the only one allowed to have my guy because my guy is okay. going to win it. Got it. Just so you know. 
Um, you know, Langer's not in the field. He blew his Achilles. What's so that? Can't go with, you know, Langer blew his Achilles, so he's not no, no, He's not back. No. My guy so, has no uh, Achilles. That's the thing, okay. right? I mean, I'm right. telling you, there's no flaw. I feel like okay. you're about to break into a version of Sister Act, but my guy, and it's going to be about your golfer every no, time you I'm, keep saying this I'm over and over again. You, I'm telling you, guys, listen, you guys laugh now, and then all I got to say is just prepare yourself, right? Prepare yourself. Um, Will, before we get into talking about the Masters, and I apologize for asking the simplistic and what is probably obvious to people that follow golf avidly, but for those like myself that are basically, you know, the majors followers, yep, I, I am a little bit confused, and then you tell me if I'm just totally in the dark here, about where things stand in terms of the alleged merger with Liv and the dissolve of that and everything else and the different golfers in different series. I thought it was all going to be under one umbrella, but it seems like that has stalled. Or am I just completely out to lunch because I'm paying way too much attention to, like, my guy who is, you know, shooting 60s other places? No, you're right. It, it has completely stalled. I think that there's so much that has to come together and so many contracts and promises and guarantees that the ability to snap fingers and make this happen seamlessly overnight, we now realize is next to impossible. There are continuing conversations. They happen a lot slower, and there's a lot of time between those conversations or more time than I think most fans and members of the media would like to have happen. So it's a very slow-churning train towards resolution, and the problem is is that golf has lost a chunk of its fan base in, in the wake of that train, and I don't know if we'll ever get them back, to be honest. I, I, you know, If you want to get really nerdy about it, Jake, this is the most watched golf event of the year. A lot of people only watch the Masters and, you know, no disrespect to the other three majors. Like, this is a big week. If we have a halfway decent leaderboard and it looks like we're going to have good weather on the weekend, I am very intrigued by the ratings on Sunday. Because if the Masters ratings are down, the way that ratings across the board are down in professional golf, or even if they're down half the level of it, then all of golf has to realize we've got a problem here. Because if people aren't watching the Masters because they're so turned off by the greed and the separation and the – it's not even – we don't even have the circus show of last year, which is, you know, PGA Tour versus Live. Like, all these guys are singing this kumbaya we to come back together for the good of the sport, and they're saying it on their giant mountains of money. Um, but if, if the Masters ratings are down this weekend, like if Tiger makes the cut and the Masters ratings are still down this weekend – then we have a serious problem. It is time to sound the alarm. And this is, I mean, to put it in local language, as we've talked about before, Will, I mean, this kind of... It's the split. It's the IRL cart split all over it. Correct. It is as close to that. I mean, it's crazy to be a professional golf broadcaster who's lived my entire life in Indianapolis because I have lived this, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. It it is, and... So with that, the the other thing is this, and, and pardon my naivete of this question, but somebody that has been playing primarily live golf and then playing in a major, are the different courses and the different scoring methods, et cetera, in any way, shape, or form affecting the way like a, a rust settle of playing in then a PGA event, if that's not the no. dumbest question you've ever been asked? No, so they made their domestic debut, or I guess they came back to the United States to live last week. They played in Doral down in Florida, which is a really hard golf course. In in anticipation of these guys sort of saying, hey, look, we don't want to be rusty going into a major. So they addressed that in the way that they built their schedule. Um, so we shouldn't have that same talking point. I think the larger talking point is you're playing smaller fields. You're playing 54 holes instead of 72 holes. You're playing for mountains of money when you're already guaranteed mountains of money. Is there really a competitive spirit? And I think that's the reason why a lot of the traditional golf audience hasn't gone to watch live is they just don't feel there's any juice there. There's no emotion. There isn't legacy and things to play for beyond the crazy sums of cash that they're paying for. And so I think that that's the one thing we still can't answer is does the, does live golf prepare guys to play in high leverage pressure packed tournaments but they have so many elite players over there that, you know, can, you know, John Rahm said it yesterday in his press conference. Yes, he's played less golf this year, but he can still prepare for a tournament the way in a major, the way that he's always prepared. So I think it's a negligible gap between those on live and those in the PGA tour in terms of their readiness. And live has also done a few things to make sure that they aren't rusty arriving at Augusta this week, but I think at this point in time, you have the choice whether you want to be rusty or not. If you want to be big, fat, and happy, 
you can on live. It doesn't matter. You know, you can finish 20th out there every single week with no consequence. Uh, unlike you can't do that on the PGA tour. So that's a broader or longer, I guess, study than this week. But again, we were so far removed from a year ago when, you know, if anybody watched the Netflix show, you know, um, the uh, full swing, the first episode, they made it into this crazy, like it was live versus the PGA tour this time a year ago, which I think was overblowing it a little bit. But now that we're a year away from it it seems silly because all the guys are they're not talking like that anymore none of the players view it as us versus them it's just we have two tours now and they only come together four times a year we'll ask it a pga tour radio with us will you mention this throughout the back and forth there with jake but just as one of the key questions i want to get to you with there are a lot of layers especially at augusta to the tiger woods conversation so a couple <laughs> that you can take in any order Will he make the cut? Will he finish the entire tournament? Like he will make it from round one to round four without having to withdraw. And if we're dreaming a giddy dream, is it possible to put together another 2019 improbable type of the stars align and he's putting on another green jacket? So Tiger's own words yesterday were, if everything falls my way, then I can still win this golf tournament. And I think that compared to a lot of other players in the tournament, there are a few more things on that list that have to fall his way than Scotty Scheffler. Like, Scotty Scheffler shows up and plays good Scotty Scheffler to golf. He wins the golf tournament. That's the list. Check mark right here. Play as good as you can, win. Tiger, it's play unbelievably well. Have some guys not play as well. Have your body cooperate. You know, all of these things that go into it. Um, I think it's beneficial to him that he got a late tee time because tomorrow looks like a real washout. There's a massive line of storms that's working through the south and going to the southeast that's supposed to arrive on property sometime tomorrow morning. So the fact that he already was going to be out late, I think he doesn't have to worry about revving things up and then starting and stopping, which could be a bit of a problem. But the body is the big answer. Um, After hearing him talk yesterday, he seems to be in good spirits, comfortable with his body, to be able to give it a go. He obviously has an incredible streak here of when he has played of being able to make the cut. Now we've seen him obviously bow out when it comes to, you know, the weekend, but you know, he has never missed a cut since he was an amateur. Last time he missed a cut was in 1996. So if he's going to tee it up and continue this streak, I think he can make the cut. Um, Will his body get him all the way through Sunday? That's a huge question mark. But if we take him at his word, then he thinks that he can. And if anybody's proven us wrong, it's been Tiger Woods before. Can he win the golf tournament? I've been burned in the past. I was burned before 2019 saying, I don't think he can win another major. And I've prefaced this by saying, I don't think he can win another major because since he proved us wrong in 2019, he rolled a, a car down the hill and had you know three more reconstructive sort of surgeries. Does it, it takes a lot. Like he said yesterday, a lot has to fall into place. But small field, course history matters no one knows it better than tiger i think he can make the cut and jimmy you'll appreciate this one he was plus 120 yesterday to make the cut he's minus 115 now so the money is going towards tiger making the cut right now well that's where my money will be so thank you for that nugget i appreciate it well i mean if you want to throw money away that's fine and if you want to invest (laughs) well i'm going to make it back so i'm going to follow you on your guy well i've got monopoly on my guy oh okay um will Give me, so we'll do this in two parts. The first is this from Will Haskett. Give me a player going into the Masters that is seen by both reputation and everything else as, you know, a a legitimate favorite, but you have some pause just because lately maybe you have seen something where there might be something going on with their game and there could be potential for a slide. That would be who? Roy McIlroy. Um, He finished third last week in San Antonio. I was there. It was a really good performance from Rory. It was his first top 10 of the season on the PGA Tour. He did win on the DP World Tour, the European Tour earlier this year. But this is the this is the monkey right now. You know, this is the one that's keeping him from the career Grand Slam. And there's still so much talk around Rory because of that. Um, that I really wonder how much. Now, he's completely dialed in his schedule differently this year. He arrived late. He's not playing in the par three today. He's trying to do things, I think, to gear himself up. And I appreciate the fact that he's made those changes and he's really looking at this from a broad picture standpoint. But the thing that kind of 
gives me pause is not just how he's played, but also the one thing that I would say is a perceived weakness of Rory McIlroy's game is he still is not the greatest wedge player in the world. He has a real problem controlling the distances of his wedges. And on this golf course, with his driving prowess, when he puts himself in position to score, he's going to have to be really good because you can't airmail greens out here and miss long. And we see that miss often from Rory with a wedge in his hand. So I think of you know the big names that are there, he's easily top five most talked about as a guy that you would expect to win because of all the narrative around him. But given form and that one particular weakness, I've been sort of staying away from Rory. And honestly, guys, like I hope I'm wrong on Monday because it would be so cool to see him win the career Grand Slam. But I think it's the easy one for me to say that Rory McIlroy is the guy I'd walk away from. Okay, so the other side of it for you, Will Haskett, would be this. A guy that on paper looks like he's limping into the Masters but and I don't mean Tiger Woods, and I don't mean that in that regard. But you know what I'm saying. Somebody that that people might not be talking about, but the course itself and a few things that maybe the player has tweaked of late that you've noticed lead you to believe that he is going to perform better in the Masters than he has in terms of recent play elsewhere. That would be who. Yeah, he's been better, way better at the beginning of this year. So I think in golf circles, this wouldn't be a surprise. But he had such a bad year last year, I think, to the casual observer. He really hasn't been a much of the conversation. That's Justin Thomas. He made the Ryder Cup team kind of somewhat controversially last year because he wasn't playing very well, had his worst season of his career. But his ball striking numbers are really good. This is, as we like to call it, a second shot golf course. You have to be really, really good with your irons to be successful at Augusta. Those numbers have been fantastic so far this year for JT. Uh, he has a fire and a desire to just sort of prove people wrong and to prove himself wrong. He made a caddy change at the last minute. He used to have uh, Bones Mackay, who was Phil Mickelson's longtime caddy in the back. They parted ways last week. Uh, which I actually think is good for JT. I, I think he was getting. I think they were getting a little bit too chatty out there on the golf course and it's time for him to just bear down and do things so unlike past masters where i think justin thomas has been sort of a top five guy coming in i feel like he's a little bit under the radar and certainly coming off a down season by his and i'm a little i'm a lot more bullish on jt this week than i think i was even on some of the years where he was playing better will haskett is our guest of pga tour radio will i want to give you just a couple of names that in your mind are i don't want to say necessarily like good bets but are, are good selections if you're just going to pick somebody to outright win the thing of of yeah. people whose names that i I've know seen. Who that's going to be uh, outside of let me rephrase that i guess best to come in second since we know that's that right. jake's selection is going to be the one that's putting great. on the green jacket I'm so i'm so ready for this i can't wait me too i'm, 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 I'm yeah. as excited as you are me and eddie have made two guesses i'd like you to actually submit a guess as well before he reveals his also but of uh, people that could potentially win it that we haven't already talked about john rom of course, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I, he's in a weird spot, just sort of having to answer all these questions about why he left. And he's more recently talked about, Hey, I want to see Liv make these changes. And I think if you, if you're pro PGA tour, you can read between the lines and there's some buyer's remorse there, but it's hard to have buyer's remorse when you banked 500 million. Will yeah, for sure. Uh, man, he's a lot of strides this year and made a great debut. So yeah, he could, he could probably do it. Sure. For Victor Hovland. No. No, he's – you want to talk about a guy that's lost in the woods? He's made his third swing change or swing coach change in the last three months going into this week, which uh, he is he is searching for it in so many ways right now. Um, he could certainly find it. He's a world-class talent. But, I mean, he is – you want to talk about a guy that is unhappy playing golf right now. It feels like Victor Hovland still searching for something. couple more. Colin Morikawa. Uh, no, no, he's down as of late. Like it's not the same superpower ball striker that we saw. So I think we got to wait for him to kind of rise back up to being a top five ten player in the world. Xander Shoffley. Uh, yes, I expect him to be near the top of the leaderboard on Sunday. The question is, is he at the top, and can he deal with that? Because we've seen some a little bit of scar tissue develop in big tournaments with him of late. Last one, uh, we'll go Kepka. Oh, yeah. Big game hunter. If it's a major and he's healthy, then Kepka should be top five or six on your board. Is Tommy Fleetwood related to Matt, to Mick? Do we know? No, he's not. He's not? Okay. Does he like no. their music? Do we know that? Uh, he has the hair to go along with their music. He, I mean, he can headbang with them. Does he do well with the ladies? Because I want to know if he's a Mac. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's a little bit of a stretch. Hey, by the way, what did you think was the best U2 song of all time? I saw your... Um, 
saw your tweet last night. You know, where's, you, you where's, had a, where's your opinion? Well, here's the thing. What is their best song and what is their most iconic are probably two different answers, right? But Sure. Um, yeah, let's not get music critic here. I mean, like, best song is, I think, a little bit more. Right. Um, the one that I think – it's interesting, Will, because – and I've done this with the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and U2 because the reality is there are, like, ten correct answers, right? Yes. I, I think that if you are – like, if U2 – and I hate to say it in these terms, but sometimes like when somebody like posthumously, when you look back on like somebody in that moment, the song yep. that would play like introducing the video of, of the, the career of you two, I feel like would be the intro to pride in the name of love. Like, yeah, but I, yeah, you know, I mean, they're like, I think you said where the streets have no name. I mean, it's hard to argue that with or without you. In this country, I say streets in this country because of what that song meant post 9-11 at the Super Bowl. Like that to me is to me the most powerful song moment that you two had for an American sports fan. You know that um, with or without you got, I think, the second highest number of votes behind where the streets have no name. But Pride in the Name of Love got a lot of votes, right? Yeah, um, I saw that. Yeah. I mean, amongst you two fans, I think bad would be the answer. But I, I think with or without you or where the streets have known it. And it would have to be almost off Joshua Tree because that was their signature iconic 100%. breakthrough mainstream album. Or you know? whatever the song was they wrote for that Batman movie that was terrible. You Anybody know, that says yeah. Beautiful Day is immediately <laughs> exiled along with people that are barefoot on an airplane. Okay, here are my, here are my cool. golfers, and then I will lead to my prediction of who's going to win the Masters. But I have three to ask you about first. You ready? Please give me Thunder Bear. Please. Min Woo Lee. Oh, uh, yeah. You – um. On the rise. Thank you. Incredible young ah, talent. Thank you. Good, good pick. He may miss the cut, though. No, no, okay. All right. But, so that was, but I'm telling you. That was like, a big glossing up but, and an undercut. I mean, that is, that is a home run of, uh, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what the Indy car equivalent would be at the Indy 500. But, Santino but, you know, Ferrucci. The guy that, yeah, that, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay. I like it. Ludwig Niemann. That's two different players. <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, wait, is it? <laughs> Ludwig Oberg or Joaquin Neiman. That's, both I'm, of them I'm sorry. I have, Joaquin I, Neiman. Neiman. I have Joaquin Neiman written right underneath it. Sorry if you combine both Neiman. golfers, could they win it? That, Lud, <laughs> Ludwig Aberg is what I said because I, he is the composer of golf, right? Yeah, he uh incredible talent, great driver of the golf ball. He's a Masters rookie. I think Neiman is a big-time pick. I almost picked him to win the whole thing. So Neiman was actually my – he's my place, but my winner. Are you ready for my winner? If it's Here we go. Me, Eddie, I'm hanging up. Eddie, if it's who? Well, have you been to, uh, well, let me see, uh, Santiago, Chile? Uh huh. So next year at the Winner's Banquet, Chile will be served. You know why? Because Neiman, the Chilean one? Uh, we already did the Neiman one, though. No, no, no. Not a Chilean. Santiago oh, de la Fuente. <laughs> Santiago de la Fuente. <laughs> it, let me tell you, you guys laugh now. Laugh now, right? I'm not laughing. Thank I am. you, Eddie. I am. Thank you. Listen, I mean, he a, is. You know, he's an amateur, right? I, like he is. A, like a, no, in college. Uh, so. Okay. <laughs> Theoretically, he's an amateur, but you know, I mean, like ten years ago, did you really think the point guard of Kentucky was an amateur? I mean, come on. Santiago De La Fuente is coming in. He has not one but two different amateur tournaments where he's been under a 65. He shot a 60 at one point. Now, granted, I think it was actually, to be honest with you, at the Cancun putt putt, but that's okay. And. He is right now at plus two hundred fifty thousand. You put down twenty bucks on Santiago de la Fuente, you get fifty grand. That's the guy that's going to win the Masters. I don't. I'm, I'd have to look it up. I don't know how many winners of the South American amateur, uh, Latin American amateur, excuse me, have made the cut since they gave him an exemption to the Masters. But um, maybe, maybe your guy makes the cut this year. Is I don't. I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. Stick okay. with Neiman. Take all that money you're going to bet on De La Fuente and put it on Neiman Listen, because he I mean, pe almost was my answer at the beginning of the show when you asked me who my pick was. My pick, by the way, is Hideki Matsuyama. Oh, nice. Uh, Jasper Stubbs. I mean, I like a guy that's named after both an engine and a barbecue sauce, right? Okay. But all right, here you go. I have no idea who that is. Jasper I, Stubbs? I, 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 thought, I have no <laughs> idea who that is. He's got a toe problem. But other than that, no. he no, he has a really good chance. I'm telling you. But he is just two spots ahead in the odds of Santiago de la Fuente. Which he must have won like the British Am. I, I've honestly, I saw it today when I was looking at the field, and I'm embarrassed to say this on a mic like over the airways. I have no idea. Who he that won is. the Brookshire <laughs> tournament uh, in Carmel uh, last week. Yeah, he got, no, he got his pass. It was in Jasper. Oh, it was Come Jasper. On. My fault. Uh, hey, what about Sam Burns? Uh, 
you know, not the same golfer in level and his wife's due any minute. So if she goes into labor, he's gone. So bet at your own risk. Is that, is that confirmed? I know it's a really weird question, but has he publicly said that? I have no idea. I'm just asking yes, you. Like, both okay. he and Scotty okay. Scheffler, okay. who are best friends, they've rented a house together this week without their wives because their wives are at home. And uh, Scheffler, Meredith Scheffler is due in, I think, three weeks. So we're feeling a little bit better. But uh, Sam Burns' wife, I think her due date is like early next week. So if either one of them get a call, which is something to watch out for. I mean, Scheffler could be leading by 20 going into Sunday, and if Meredith goes into labor early, he's out of there. Joaquin so. Neiman, by the way, wins. I just looked this up. Joaquin Neiman is the clubhouse leader and the odds-on favorite to win in the NSDF category. That's the non-Santiago de Fuente ah, category. That's good. Because he's going to win. <laughs> do they do they have a setup, like, for hypothetically speaking, because I have no idea. You mentioned that his wife, Sam Burns' wife, is with him right now. Is that right? No, 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 she's back. Okay, Dallas. I was gonna say because because if she was with him, like, travel. does Augusta have a setup for that where it's like, yeah, if it's a nighttime delivery, you're all good. We'll see you back out there uh, at eight a.m. tea time on Saturday. Like, it, it's literally no, all no, bets no. are off. Okay, no, all right. the PJ is fired up and ready to go uh, back to Dallas if okay. Meredith goes into labor. All right. So, so my pick, Ludwig Aberg is my is my. It's going to come down to basically. I don't know that there's necessarily going to be. Um, you know, like a playoff for it. Ludwig's going to be right there, but Joaquin Neiman is the guy. That's if Santiago de Fuente, only if he gets homesick and goes home. I'm taking Zalatoris. Okay. I'm going to go with Neiman. Will, your pick, or do you not do picks? No, you said pick? Matsuyama is my you pick. Matsuyama, Neiman was right. almost my pick, so I'm going to let you have Neiman, and then you can boast when the Neiman play actually happens. And if somehow your top three come true, again, an no. Oberg Neiman top two is possible, but if De La Fuente is in there, then Chris Ballard's drafting a kicker. Like, that's what happens in the world. <laughs> what's you know, the, just... I always forget. What's the uh, the Waste Management Open? Isn't that what it's called? That's like the big party that's gotten out of yeah, hand? Yeah, I was there this year. Yeah. Okay. So, my understanding is Neiman is really good at that, right? At Waste Management? I just – where is that tournament? Where does it take place? Scottsdale. Yeah, which is Phoenix, right? Yeah. Yeah, so naturally, Joaquin should be good there. I'm just saying. Oh, I see you did there. Yeah, got it. I'm telling you, that's who's going to win. It's better than long Stubbs. As- Santiago de Fuente, though, I'm, I'm just just mark my words. Will, we appreciate it. I'm sure this is probably 20 minutes could, of your life you'll never get back. Could de la Fuente it. finish top 20? Like, yes. I, I, no, no, I I want. I don't think so. Okay. All right. I don't. I, no, right. no, I don't think so at all. Okay. Why? What do you have against I mean, him? <laughs> we, I mean, we we've seen amateurs play well and maybe get top 20s in this tournament before, but there are a number of other amateurs like. Christo Lamprecht, who's six eight stud from Georgia Tech, who was leading after round one of the Open Championship last year. Like there are guys. Sam Bennett last year played well, still as an amateur before he turned pro. So we've got history of amateurs playing really well in this event. But this is it's going to be a tough week for your guy Dale left one. Okay, here's the thing. I, I'm I'm predicting right now. Okay, like I said, Will Nostradamus is my homie. Yep. Two years from now, I'm going to be, you know, just minding my own business around a, a peaceful afternoon, and my phone is going to blow up, and it's going to be because Santiago has all, De La Fuente has won a tournament or is surging, and people are going to be like, "Oh my gosh, where have I heard that name with before? you?" Yeah, Correct. I got it. I'm always in front of. It wasn't raining when No built the ark, man. Don't you think you, they would know it. his name because he would have won the Masters at that point before they remembered? <laughs> oh yeah, Jake. No, 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 said no. He's, that. Saying, he's saying that Jake started uh, the hype now, oh, okay. correct? And All then right, he eventually correct. finds that correct. success that Jake knew he was destined. I for remember. I remember. Will. Will. Listen, you're a Washington Township guy. What middle school were you? Eastwood. Okay, exactly. As was I. I'm sorry. Wait, that's and, not what you call that place. I remember. What's that? That's not called Eastwood. What's it called, Jake? Beastwood. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Well, listen, I was there. But when I was in in 1989, people laughed at me because I kept telling them that the future of golf was a guy, and I picked it because his initials were EW, just like the baseball hat I had. And I said, EW, Eldrick. And he goes by Tiger, but his name's Eldrick. And everybody laughed at me. Who is this guy? Never heard of him. And I said, just wait. He was on Johnny Carson when he was little. He's going to be good. And here we are. That's who Santiago de Fuente is. He was on Fallon? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Boy, Will. You- you're welcome. See you guys. Sorry. <laughs> we'll ask it. I'm telling you. You know that Tiger Woods was on. No, Tiger I do. I, I'm from, I am familiar with that. That's why I made the Fallon joke. Yes, I am. Is this in I the same? I don't like Jimmy Fallon because he laughs at his own stuff the entire time. I'm not. Fallon's not my favorite of the right. current guys. But... Is this in the same level of uh, guaranteeing Indiana was going to upset Michigan at the no, Big no, House? No, no, no. That, that was misunderstood, Eddie. That was misunderstood.
I said in the first quarter. No, here's what's going to happen. Okay. De La Fuente is going to be leading the the front nine Correct. against uh, the first round. And we're it's going to be just like Indiana, just, Michigan, right? Just like IU, Michigan. That's right. And then Tom <laughs> Allen's going to get up there and start jumping around and asking him to start. What is it he does there, Eddie? <laughs> and what's he say right when you're about to, right in the middle of your backswing? What's Tom Allen say? Oh, my goodness. I can't even remember. A one, a two. two. And you, you know, know what, what to do. do. And, and then that's going to throw everything off. And that's what's going to happen to poor Santiago de la Fuente. It happened to Indiana. They got up like 10 nothing against Michigan in the first quarter, as I predicted. They'd win the first quarter. Yep. And then Tom Allen all of a sudden went in and he became you know, Gene Kelly. And he put on dancing shoes and started <laughs> tap dancing and snapping. And Singing everybody the rain, freaked out. Go. And all then right. before you know it, it was a buzzsaw. And he hit five in a row in the water. That's not going to happen to Santiago. This guy's cool under pressure, buddy. I'm telling you. And have you ever had a Fuente cigar? I've not, no. Oh. Well, that's the thing. The Arturo Fuente. It's a victory cigar. Top it's shelf. going to be a victory cigar in the Masters when Santiago yeah. de la Fuente wins and stuns the I world. heard he already has them, actually, in his bag. He's ready to go. He does. That's what I'm telling you. He's yep. confident. Yep. He shot a 60 in a tournament, right? I mean, the last one had to go around a windmill in between a gorilla's legs, but still, it was I very do, impressive. I do tend to defer to Will, though. Amateurs, I mean, it's, it's tough. I hope it happens. I hope it is, because that, that means we were here to see history. Twice. Both when he wins and when you said it. Listen, VJ Singh was at the banquet last night, right? He was at the dinner, yeah. wearing the jacket. Yeah. Guess what? Santiago, right there next to him on the odds list. Just telling you. Business. It's all just.
Gary Woodland. If this were PBA, I'd go. I'd be all about Gary Woodland. I'd be all in. But it's PGA. Wrong letter. So I can't go with Gary Woodland. Right? Isn't that happens a lot with people trying to search PGA on Google? I think they accidentally add the B. And they're like, wait a minute. Yes. What's happening? Like Mike Albee is going to win. Really? <laughs> who's the guy? That's, <laughs> who's the man I am? Exactly. Who do you think you are? I am. Who do you think you are? I am. That's that's what it was. Yep. Now Patrick Reed, like I said, he's the guy that nobody likes, right? Correct. Okay. Joaquin Neiman, only if Santiago De La Fuente has an issue. <laughs> what? I just I would imagine being an amateur at Augusta that the list of potential issues you could have would be large. <laughs> it's just an, listen, just you be the ball. See the ball and be the ball, right? It's all in your head. It's just another. It, just tap it, it in. It's just golf. Just tap it in, Santiago. Just tap I think it you'll in. find that this court is the same size as ours back at Hickory. It's the same thing. It's all in the hips. It's same all thing. in the hips. By the way, uh, did you see, speaking of Hoosiers, I think it's the New York Post is not under fire, but people were like, what are you doing? Because they – they kind of stalked out Gene Hackman and got a photo of Gene Hackman coming out of a gas station after buying a coffee. And they had taken a photo of Gene Hackman like three weeks ago, and he's wearing the same outfit. And they literally put it under the headline of acting legend Gene Hackman goes out for coffee wearing same outfit as three weeks ago. And people are like, okay. I mean, we do we do shows every day on this station and people can watch in the break room thank you on youtube and and i would hazard a guess i have probably worn the same outfit twice in like a week sweatshirt maybe but i mean you know or like in a two or three week period but gene hackman i mean he's 94 years old and i think it's really hard for actors and actresses just people of fame in general because we get so like you don't go if you live in indiana or like during the NCAA tournament, you very rarely go like a month without seeing an image of Hoosiers, right? So in yeah. your mind, and and that was that movie was filmed almost forty years ago. So you're like, well, he looks terrible. Well, does he, or does he look forty years older than when you last really permanently saw him, where he was in his late fifties? Seinfeld's a prime example. Like you see Jerry Seinfeld or Julie Louise Dreyfus, and you're like, oh my gosh. You're like, well, yeah, it's because you watch them each and every night in syndication where they are trapped in 1995. And you forget, you know, they've probably aged a little bit. Now, I showed you guys the video of me. I'm jarred by that, by the way. Like, I I have not, to your example, I have not seen a photo of Gene Hackman since, like, you know, Enemy of the State and, like, you know, that type Correct. of. That, you know, I understand why the New York Post would rightfully so be backlashed with that. But that's crazy. Like no, that's it doesn't, doesn't even look like the same person. Well, but here's the thing you have to keep in mind. In the photo that you're looking at of Gene Hackman that the post captured, he probably literally like got up. I mean, he's 94 years old. He probably woke up, put on like comfortable clothing, and had someone drive him to the gas station and went and got a cup of coffee. He had no idea that like I, Right. No, he's not. I get that. So he's not done. But like, up, I right? saw my late father age, and like, even then, like into his 80s, like, I could still, and maybe that's different because I knew my dad. Well, right? what, Versus- what I'm getting at is the Gene Hackman that we have always seen is one that has been sitting in a makeup chair and sure. a hair and, and everything fair. else for an hour, two hours, right? I mean, he looks, he, I got news for you. Like, I mean, I, Jimmy, this is going to be hard for, for you to grasp, but. Each and every day, you get to see right here, you know, six foot four of polished <laughs> sexiness, okay. right? It, it, it's not necessarily, I mean, I do have to bathe and like, and do my hair. Now tell me this, the makeup staff you hire, is that a write-off? Did you just finish your taxes or no? <laughs> I, had a, I had a Mac card for a long okay. time when okay. I was in television, by the way. Now, th- this is all, and, and don't kid yourself, I mean, this kind of glow and radiance, yeah. it does come with spray assistance. I'm not going to lie about that. It's nice you'd be open and honest. But I the look, I love me, I love me some me. And so I want to make sure that that I um, when I look in the mirror and adore and admire myself that I look okay. But yeah, I mean, obviously it is when you look at that photo, it's like, oh my god. I'm not even talking about like the overall posture of it. I mean facial features. Yeah, like I well, don't see he, he is obviously 
he's obviously lost you know he's I would assume he's not well because he's lost a ton of weight but he again he's 94 years old I mean yeah he he looks like he has probably going through some health things but he's 94 years old yeah now the other thing I couldn't tell is that a pack of smokes in his hand or is that an apple pie <laughs> honestly <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. Do you see what I'm talking about? I do. I'm at the zoom in. I I know that we're on radio and people can't see this, but Gene Hackman's coming out of a gas station and he's got a cup of coffee in one hand and then a box in the other hand. And at first I thought he was carrying out a box of lung darts, but I think it's an apple pie, right? Like a McDonald's apple pie. But again, the photos that you have seen of him, like I'm looking right now and you're like, wow, he looks great there. And it says Gene Hackman in 2003. Well, that's 20 years ago. I mean- you know, he, but he is, yes, he's lost significant weight. Great actor, though. And oh, one of my favorites, yeah. The, um, you know, there are a lot of stories about the fact that when he did Hoosiers, he was apparently grossly opposed to it and was not on board with it at all. Now, when Hoosiers was being filmed, in other words, he thought it was going to be a bust movie and he, he was like, hey, I just did it because I needed money. When Hoosiers was filmed, I worked for years at a cigar store in Broderpool called Hardwick's Pipe and Tobacco which was the best job, no offense to you guys, or IndyCar. Best job I've ever had. I loved it. I loved every minute of working at the cigar store. And we had two locations, Broderpool Avenue and then Monument Circle, right below where we are right now, which was most recently the salad place that Gary Dick and I kept in business. But apparently not enough because it's gone. (laughs) And so, and then it became Oban Payne and then the salad place. But the Hardwick's downtown on the Circle when Hoosiers was being filmed, Dennis Hopper apparently stayed a, a decent amount of time in Indianapolis and was a cigar guy. And Dennis Hopper would come in and buy cigars by the bundle, the Hardwick's brand cigars for that matter. Uh, Hardwick's Handmade, we had the the number two and the champion were our two biggest sellers. And he apparently, that was before I worked there, but from what my boss tells me, Dennis Hopper apparently was absolutely unequivocally the nicest dude ever like would come in and was super nice and had zero ego about him at all could not have been a better guy apparently some of the others in Hoosiers I've heard not necessarily that about but with Dennis Hopper did uh Pacers last night getting a big win big win Jimmy in Toronto and um what you want to see is what you saw and that is Tyrese Halliburton breaking out of shell a little bit and then also other players kind of elevating that game. Obi Toppin last night I thought was spectacular. And just for guys to kind of get, as you head down the home stretch here and into the playoffs, you kind of want everybody clicking on all cylinders. And for the most part, they looked at last night. That's what would be achieved if you're closing the season on what would be, if they win their last two, a five-game winning streak. That is, by definition, taking care of your business. That would put them 9-1 and one on their last 10 to close the year. That would be... Again, by definition, take care of your business to get to the playoffs and not have to deal with the play-in. And really, from an offensive standpoint, outside of that first quarter, it looked a lot like the Pacers team that we had grown accustomed to seeing for the first two months of the season in terms of their offensive output. Certainly, you saw the Tyrese Halliburton that you were used to seeing through the first couple months of the season and in their run to the in-season tournament final where they end up losing to L.A. He goes for 30 last night. He looked as he has over the last couple of weeks like his old self. This looks like an offense that has finally permanently turned the corner from what they lost when they traded away Buddy Heald. His absence is still felt in some ways, but it feels like they understand where their offensive identity is, and you can rely on their bench. This is no longer, Jake, a flash-in-the-pan type of thing. You can rely on multiple avenues off of the bench, whether it's Obi Toppin, whether it is T.J. McConnell, whether it's Ben Shepard, you can rely on certain pieces on any given night, McConnell leading the pack in terms of consistency, to give you double-figure scoring. And when you're a team that, I think we're all in agreement on this, are still a piece away from being an Eastern Conference representative contender, meaning the ability to get to the NBA Finals. They're still a piece away from that happening. In order to make up that gap, you need to win certain minutes. That includes what your bench unit does, and there's no doubt that they have one of the best, led by T.J. McConnell, benches that you could face in the early rounds of the Eastern Conference playoffs. I disagree with you, by the way, on that. What's that? 
I don't think they need another piece. To represent the East? No. Well, they're not getting past Boston. Maybe so they get past this season, Milwaukee. Not this season. You look at how they performed against below 500 teams. If they just improve that number, if they win five or six more games, they're the second seed. I mean, you're still needing a nut. You still need a two way player. I, I, like I'm you need 100 percent with Jimmy. They still need one more lockdown wing. Okay, I, I I agree with you that that could be a need, but I think the I think the part of this that we're forgetting about because he's not out there right now is if Matherin develops into that next season, he did take a step step forward in every part of his game. I personally feel like this season, and if he takes another step forward next season, I think he's in that realm of conversation of the player that they don't need to acquire. But the step forward has to be on the defensive end, does it not? Correct. Correct. I, I don't know that he has, and I hate, I, I'm I'm literally going to like want to punch myself for saying this because it's such a term that I get so fatigued by. But I don't know, like when I watch entry lanes in the NBA in terms of either feeding the post, which I know is is more of a lost art, or guys simply getting to the rim. The lane itself that, that you move into to get into the lane, essentially the angles, for most teams close so quickly because of the length that people have, the wingspan that, that, that wings have. And I don't know that Matherin has that or the foot quickness laterally to become that guy. He, he might be a decent on-ball defender, but in terms of just shutting down lanes, I, I agree with Jimmy that they need a, and I know that these guys don't grow on trees, but a Paul George kind of player. I don't mean to that level of skill, but that level of physical makeup. They need one more of those. And a guy that is literally, you know, when they, the guy that was a really good player for them, and they And look, I totally understand why they let him go because of the contract that he received, which was incredible, right? But Solomon Hill is that kind of like when he when 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 they first got Oladipo and they they pushed Cleveland to seven games or whatever else. Solomon Hill in that playoff series was like, wow, like that's the kind of guy, and that's why he got overpaid because he was a wing defender. But you need like one like a Derek a poor man's Derek McKee type player. That's a wing defender that can get you 12 points yeah. without orchestrating yep. through is what they need. You know who you just described? O.G. Ananobi. Jairus Walker. Possibly. Possibly. But I think Walker, Walker again, I think of as more an on-ball defender. I don't know about, like, necessarily a space ceiling defender, side to side. We'll see. I, you, may I, be, you may very well be right, Eddie, and I think probably that's what they think as well. I think Eddie's right to a point with where this team could go like i'm all with player Their development roster is ahead of where we thought for sure right and they could take essentially a leap forward and maybe they're a three seed next year maybe heck maybe they would even be as high as a two seed if you look at what Eddie said and they're able to you know construe a couple things differently in terms of the way wins losses went for them against particular opponents but when i look around what it takes to win in the postseason and to get there whether you're at the east or the west i think there's better teams than Indiana as currently constructed when you map things out one, two, three years from now. And I think that this era, to your point, Jake, about not forgetting two years ago, they asked the fan base to be patient with how things are currently being built. There is a level of patience of knowing that I don't think this happens just by internal growth. I think it happens by acquisition of some kind, whether it's free agency, whether it's trade, to bring in one more solid two-way piece that also is a high-level shooter. Yes, I'm describing Paul George. We've joked about that. I don't think that happens, but that is the mold of player that I think would perfectly complement this team. By the way, Eddie, do we happen to have the breaking news sounder before we get to Jimmy's picks on the other side? Uh, This just in from the Indiana Fever. My dad was asking the other day, like in terms of fever televised games and things like that. Not one, not two, not three. That's a massive number. 36 times this season, the fever will be on national television. Can I jump in with one more breaking news item? Yes, sir. Uh, Purdue senior Ethan Morton has entered the transfer portal. Hmm. Started 29 games with the Bullermakers last season. Diminished role, obviously, this past year. That from Jeff Borzello on Twitter. 
36 games on national television. That's big. It's almost like they're going to draft somebody that brings in numbers. <laughs> right? You mean they're they're not getting their eyes really big after looking at the record-setting uh, national final that happened on the women's side uh, on Sunday night? Exactly, right? <laughs> and semifinal, and, you know. That's crazy. Most watched basketball game in, what, five years? Seven, I think, right? Seven, Since yeah. It's incredible. Uh, we'll come back, get Jimmy's picks, and hand it up to John next. Hey, it's JMV for your 14th Central Indiana Joe Childers run. This is me, all right? I'm not a athlete. This is my play. This is how I win. Today's plays of the day. We begin first with some Champions League. Getting underway in about seven minutes from now, we'll take Paris Saint-Germain on the money line over Barcelona in that same game. We will that also PSG? Take, we will also take PSG. Killian Mbappe as an anytime goal scorer. The other game taking place at the same time, Atletico Madrid will win outright over Dortmund. Last soccer bet for tonight. It's been good to us all year. We'll continue to ride it as well. Plus 135 
outright goal scorer anytime for Lionel Messi. In baseball, we'll lay one and a half on the run line over the New York for the New York Yankees against the Miami Marlins. And in basketball tonight, give me the Dallas Mavericks on the road against the Miami Heat. Eddie, anything from you? I do not hate no you. No bets from Eddie. Hate you. You hey, hate James, me? let me see your shoes really oh. quick. Okay. Lift them up. Let me see. Jake, let's check them out. Oh, yeah, James was in the stall back there when I was in the bathroom. I was going to shut the lights <laughs> off on him because I thought, those that's James' shoes back there. I was going to shut the lights off, and then some dude that I didn't recognize walked in and had to whiz, <laughs> so I didn't do it. This is the first time I've ever seen James without a hat. <laughs> I know it. No, I shouldn't say that. The other day, no, he, he took that. He's got the... The man. He's going up, with right? the Scott Stapp look today. Yeah, it's, you know. <laughs> I know it's Creed. I'm gonna have to call him Creed today. What's up, Creed? <laughs> uh, John, what do you got upcoming? How about 36 games for the Fever? By 36 the way? games for the Fever, and then some said that it would not have an impact with Caitlin Clark. Hey, would it be a real curveball if they decided not to draft Caitlin Clark? You know what? I. I <laughs> and then, wait a minute. We okay. got 36 games on national TV. And <laughs> the <laughs> oops, that'd be a great trick. Is the center for South Carolina in the draft? Yes. What's her name? Camila uh, Cardozo. I mean, man. I mean, yeah. What What if this isn't the case? And I know Caitlin Clark is coming yes. here, and I think it's going to be awesome, and it's fabulous, and I think she's a tremendous, a, a seriously, you know, game changing talent. I mean, I yes. get that. It is still Aaliyah Boston's team. Love Aaliyah Boston, but what, by the way. What if, what if she's Jimmer Fredette? Yeah. I don't think anybody cares right now. I think you'll worry Her, about that later. Right? I mean, Jimmer never got that far in the sport, though. Yeah, like he. I get what you're saying, but he was never on the national stage like she was. No, I know, but I'm just saying in terms of the translation to the next level. I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think, and not to mention, I think she's an unbelievable passer. You know what I mean? She can shoot from anywhere, but she's a very she has very good. I mean, she's. I'm just saying. I, I don't think. I think I it's more reasonable to, be, to say, what if she's JJ Redick and not Steph Curry? Like, what if she's just a good three point right. shooter and that's all she is? Well, but I think she has better court vision. So do I. So do I. You know what I mean? But is hmm. there is there the possibility that, that, that there's somebody that they see as a better long-term can player? Can you imagine? That'd be great. That'd be the uh, the biggest sandbag in the history of sandbags <laughs> right there. Like Chris Ballard would probably bow at the altar of sandbagging greatness right Chris there. Chris Ballard would trade the Caitlin Clark pick for three second-rounders, well, right? Well, look, that's just great gamesmanship. <laughs> well, look. Well, you don't have your arms crossed. <laughs> you also don't have a hat on. <laughs> when he sits with me, it's like, all right, I would rather have a root canal, an enema, <laughs> than be talking to this clown right here. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's because he can't control that narrative, right? <laughs> I don't blame him, though. Listen, if, I, if I'm if i driving home and I turn me on and we're, and uh, I'm hearing Does me. Does that happen a lot? Yes. It just happened like, I don't know, three hours ago. <laughs> okay. No, but if I if I hear that, I'd get mad too, and I'd think, who's this clown? I'd do the same thing. I'd react the same way. I wouldn't want to hear that. None of us want to hear that. Right. So I, get it. I completely understand. That, I've said so. before, I mean, yeah. it, it is only fair that people can criticize us because what do we do? We, we sit here oh, and talk about. Biggest clown in the world sitting right here between you. Right. So. Yeah. All right, John's up next. Big show lined up. We will be back with you. Uh, Eddie, you're off to Seattle, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Safe travel. Seattle. Got to go to the top of the Eddie space here. That's right. Yeah, tell them you're Eddie Vedder. Uh, we'll be back with you, though, at noon tomorrow. Thanks for listening. The Wake Up Call with Kate.